Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson. Thanks for checking out the podcast here on YouTube. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notifications bell. You'll get a notice anytime we upload some new content. And when I'm not asking Bruce, hey, how big was Batista's, well, you know. One of the things I like to do is help people save money. And if you're watching this video right now and you're in a 30 year loan, man, you're overpaying your single biggest bill and you may not even realize it. I want you to do a little experiment for me. Take your calculator out, multiply your monthly house payment by 360 payments. That's how many payments there are in a 30 year loan. That big scary number, that's your total of payments. You're looking at that number? You know you can do better. Keep more of your own money right now and go to SaveWithConrad.com. Or maybe you've got credit card debt. Man, it's not a matter of if I can save you money with that. Your average interest rate on a credit card is more than 20%. And by the way, all the interest you pay on those credit cards, it's not tax deductible. Whereas the mortgage interest, well, that is tax deductible. So if you owe this debt, it's up to you how to pay it back. Doesn't it make sense to get the cheapest rate possible and the greatest tax deduction possible? Find out how much money you can save right now for free at SaveWithConrad.com. You don't need perfect credit, even scores in the 500s can be approved, and it's no cost out of pocket. But maybe best of all, we're licensed in more than 40 states. We can help more families than ever before. But how much can we save you? Find out right now for free with a quick quote from SaveWithConrad.com. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to my world. And of course, we couldn't do it without the Hall of Famer himself, ladies and gentlemen, Double J, Jeff Jarrett. Jeff, how are you, man? Conrad, I am fired up. It's Sunday morning as we record this. Uh, me and you have had zero chit chat. We push play. I've got a busy day, got baseball league meetings and team meetings, and we have no, uh, we'll call it no warm up conversation. Uh, so, roll tide. Uh, I have the feeling you have multiple sayings that you could share with us today. Uh, when that last play of the game took place last night with, uh, Bama, we got the Titans playing today. We got a big Alabama, Tennessee next weekend. I don't even know where to get started. Are we ever going to get to this topic? Or are you going to continue with your strategy of complaining? Well, I just welcomed everybody <laughs> to the show and that's what happened. Uh, let's talk about it though. As you and I are recording this, the new, uh, the new rankings are not out, but the last times I saw it it had Tennessee ranked number eight in the nation, Alabama was number one. Last I saw, and last I saw Bryce young, our Heisman recipient last year, our starting quarterback was on the shelf and they say this season's not done. They say he'll be back. And this coming week, number one plays number eight. It's undefeated Tennessee. Do they have a chance, Jeff? Realistically. What's the old, uh, Jim Carrey. So you're saying there's a chance. <laughs> no, uh, Saban's post game comments. Hopefully we get our quarterback on the field means he's coming. Yep. Uh, um, I think Tennessee, we've got to move up. One spot, maybe two spots. I saw online that this will be the biggest game in Knoxville uh, since the 90s. Yes. Since before Cody was born. Yes. Well, if you want to get go ahead before. Um, Back Aaron when WCW was, born, was a thing. Before Aaron was born, before Kira was born, before Jacqueline was born. This is back when you were Intercontinental Champ. That's how long ago this was. <laughs> a long time ago. Oh, Conrad. Vince uh, McMahon just, still had a job. That's how long ago that was. Who you know, was? Vince McMahon was still employed. Oh, well, see. By the way, how funny. We haven't even addressed this. Isn't it a little interesting that Vince McMahon's out of wrestling before Jeff Jarrett is? <laughs> Would you stop it? <laughs> I'm going to outsmart them all. <laughs> Boys and girls, tag team back again. Here we go. Talking a little bound for glory. Oh seven. We tried last week. Jeff wouldn't shut the hell up with all of his sidebars and notice he switched gears awful fast when I wanted him to make a prediction on that Tennessee. Okay. Game. Let's look. If, if, it, if it was in Tuscaloosa, Birmingham, mm, it would be, it just be, be tough, but Alabama little rattled Bryce. Uh, oh, don't say they weren't rattled against A&M down to the last play of the game. Last play of you guys could have gotten beat on the last play of the game, no doubt. True or false? AM's not even ranked. 
Did, did we? Are you just going to kind of skip over this? Like, where'd you watch the game last night? If you don't mind me getting into your personal. I, I, I watched with my mother and father and uh friend. Oh my friend. gosh. Poor Larry. Was he on pins and needles? Was it? All right. Let me ask you this. Was he sitting or standing on the last play of the game? He was seated. No, he wasn't. No, he was standing. You're right. <laughs> yeah, I was standing. Hell, I was way past my bedtime. Um, uh, Anyhow, football, what a it's a fantastic game for TV. It's just Are you it, gonna pick is it Alabama or Tennessee? Oh God, you are on Ray. See? No, listen, you keep changing the damn subjects, Eric Bischoff. I asked a pretty simple question. You claim to be a Tennessee volunteer. I know that's what you are in your heart, but in your head, as you sit here and try to outsmart them all, every single broadcast here on my world. Tell us who you think is going to win next week. Abyss would have given us a straight answer by now. I don't try to outsmart them all on every broadcast. So Abyss is, he's delusional. He thinks Joe Burrow is the next Joe Montana. That guy won't even be in the league in the next two years. But anyhow, um, that'll get some. He will be in the league in two years. Come on. Yeah, he will. He will. Yeah. I love pushing uh, his buttons. Uh, Tennessee. I'd like to be rigorous honesty here. It's they're gonna lose. No, 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 no. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm just. I'll give a couple of. The game will be decided in the first four to five minutes of the third quarter. The halftime adjustments are gonna be huge in this game because it's gonna be a close first half. And I'm gonna go down and Tennessee wins by four. Okay. Okay. There you go. That's what you're going with? Put that, put that in your Smythe and poke it, pal. Alabama, as as I'm uh, as we're recording, is a nine and a half point favorite. Look. Amazing. I say, I say Alabama covers. Really? Covers? Yeah. yeah. Alabama not only wins, they win by 10 or more. And I would love to make a bet with you here on the program. The question is slap nuts. Do you have the sack to do it? Man, there's a lot of big things going on. And <clears throat> let's talk about what Saturday is really triple mania 30. It's like WrestleMania 30 for Lucha Libra. It's happening this Saturday and you don't have to pick Alabama, Tennessee are going to be your pregame. You can watch that on CBS and then immediately flip it over to fight at watch Just go to watch and you're going to have the best Saturday ever because here's what I'm proposing live here on the broadcast. We're going to see if Jeff has the sack to do it. Loser gets their head shaved. It's a hair match next week here on the program. What say you? Al, I'm out smart them all. There's a payday involved in hair. <laughs> Guaranteed payday. I love my balls. I really do. And I think we've got better than a, just a shot at it. Even if I spot you nine and a half, no hair match. Hell no. Oh, I love it. Well, what can we do? Can we do a country whipping match with Cassio and Cody? You know what? Loser receives 10 lashes. <sighs> From the other, I don't want. I don't want to do that. I didn't even say from the other. Let's get. Let's get. I want to get Cody Cody involved. involved. Let's get. uh, I I want Corey involved, and Uh, and Cassio. Oh, you want Cody involved, huh? Well, I mean, don't you think Cody'd have a lot of fun whipping me? Oh, he would have a blast. Are you kidding me? He would. All right, that's it. Yeah, there you go. So wait, uh, who's whipping you on my end? Is this Megan? No, thank you. (laughs) (laughs) No, thank you. All right. We'll figure it out. But either way, I was at the beach, obviously this past week, Uh, Conrad, there were some folks, uh, low key, uh, some some good old boys from Kentucky. Yeah. Hey, we saw that Rick players last match. All the kind of chitter chatter, you know, then they, you know, where they're going with it. Hey man, because Karen's obviously there and you know, she's up under her chair, sunbathing, whatever. And, uh, Man, they got after it. Now, Jeff, look, let me ask you. 
just between men. What really happened with Conrad's wife? <laughs> Isn't that great? <laughs> Dude. So I don't want the lashes for Megan. No, thank you. She's uh she's a little feisty. She was feisty that July uh for uh, summer night of July thirty first. It, it's uh it's spread here in Huntsville. There's folks who are now legitimately afraid of her. I'm not kidding. <laughs> it's kind of hilarious. Oh, Conrad, Conrad, beautiful day at the beach, all fired up. We're going to get into this topic. And last thing, last week's episode with the concussion, yep. and social media chatter, and the it comes in, I guess, waves and different things. And as you got rolling last week or I got rolling, how did that even happen? That's a whole nother conversation. But uh, multiple emails. I uh, got some emails from Australia, got an email from London the, the, in, in Australian rules football, in um, uh, rugby. Uh, we call it soccer. They call it football. The head injury situation is it's amazing what science will teach us, but yeah. man, is it. And there were a couple of plays over the weekend. Guys got tossed out of games. Yeah. All oh, the head injury, that is, uh, man, you were spot on. I appreciate you taking us down that road. I wasn't exactly sure. I really wasn't. But, man, we really got into a deep conversation. I got a lot of positive feedback out of that. That and then the social media uh, is is used for branding, which is kind of, it's just, just, it's a generational. My kids yeah. or 20-year-old folks, it, it's, it's a conversation piece or it's how they communicate. A lot of folks don't even text now. It's Snapchat. It's, it's, uh, it's DM or whatever. They just don't think of social media as, as marketing first. It's like third, fourth, or fifth. So uh, fascinating conversation that we, that we had. And kudos to you for steering the ship. And I mean that. You steered the ship. We didn't get to the topic, yeah. which I kind of chuckled as we passed the 60 minute mark. I said, we're not even in, a, in, in my back of my mind. We're not even through one TV of this. No, uh, it's going to be a three hour. But anyway, thanks, pal. Let's roll. Well, before we go, uh, you mentioned Snapchat. Are you a Snapchatter? Oh, I've got it. But no, I'm not. I mean, no, no. But kids, that is how they communicate. A lot. Oh no, I'm not arguing that. I just, yeah, yeah. yeah I didn't yeah. imagine you were up there Snapchatting that ween, but I was like, what? What, <laughs> what in the world? Well, that's what they out of the gutter. It's Sunday morning, Conrad. But My gosh, use it for. <laughs> All right, here we go. We uh, we started talking about it last week. We're gonna try to pick up where we left off. It's Bound for Glory 2007. By the way, you can go watch this. Impact has a fantastic app that I don't think enough people are talking about. We're all familiar with the WWE Network over on Peacock. Why don't you go to impactwrestling.com forward slash packages? And when you use our promo code, Jeff, you're going to get hooked up. We want you to see all this great stuff that we're talking about. We've spent so much time talking about the good old days of TNA and how it all got started. You can go watch all of those episodes right now at impactwrestling.com forward slash packages and sign up for impact. Plus it's on the low, low and use the code Jeff J E F F. And uh, go ahead and get hooked up impactwrestling.com forward slash packages promo code Jeff. Hey, on that shout out to them bound for glory Friday, Albany, couple of surprises, couple of, uh, rock and roll matches. I'm looking forward to, uh, I didn't get to see it. I was, uh, traveling family and all that, but, uh, here, here, our friend Josh, uh, tore the house down. Um, anyway. I heard it was a hell of an event. I'm looking forward to it. But uh, who would have thunk back on June 19, 2002, that uh, 20 years, years later, change. yeah, we're talking about an app, and you can go catch it all. That's crazy. Code, code word, J-E-double-F. Listen to you. <laughs> hey, so uh, we didn't talk about any of the current wrestling stuff. Um, thank you for mentioning Bound for Glory. It's a criminally underrated show. I think more people should be talking about it. It's consistently good. And then of course this coming weekend, it's a uh, watch triple com. Pretty excited about that. But as you and I record this, we've got a WWE pay-per-view in the rear view mirror. Oh, wow. and now we know Bray Wyatt is back. There's lots of speculation about what was going to happen with Bray and would he ever come back to WWE or would he show up in AEW or. 
Then we started to hear he had an offer from other sources. I'm just curious. Were you surprised to see Bray back? You were there when he was, I think, let go before. What do you remember about this? Or what, was, was, your, what was your take? I was there this? also when he took off. Yeah. Uh, in those creative meetings, uh, there's a Bray and Seth Rollins were headed out on a live event tour and me and the chairman um, stayed up on the fourth floor till about three in the morning talking through live event matches. So uh, it, no, it didn't surprise me at all. I'm, I'm happy for Bray and the fiend and my codes was uh, all in and the reveal and the production and everything. You know, I know it's not everybody's cup of tea, but uh, he's got, such a unique connection, but it didn't surprise me. Um, I, I'd venture to say that happened less than 12 hours ago. I'd say the number one seller right now in merch in multiple categories and probably multiple items would be the fiend. His numbers are. It's astounding. It's, it's unbelievable, but uh, the character's different. Uh, but I, I got, those were fun, fun live events to discuss and talk about and produce and be around. And anyhow, didn't surprise me. That's your question. Uh, but, um, uh, it was, it was good stuff. It would have been a little bit like trying to see the undertaker in WCW if he would have went somewhere else. I think, Oh, no, fans, it, whether you love him or hate him as that character, You'll always think of him as that character. I think like it would be hard for me to imagine him not being Bray Wyatt. Oh, I don't even, I mean, it's well, I mean, we could go down the whole list of multiple folks like that. I mean, there's, I mean, you just could, uh, pick your, uh, if I say one, it's like, I'm saying them out, but there's multiple folks like that, but I, I never, ever, ever thought that there was even the slightest chance of Bray going anywhere, but back to WWE. Well, I'm glad he's back. A uh, really cool guy. Uh, I'm pulling for him. And, uh, I'm also pulling for us to actually get on our freaking topic today. It's bound for glory. 2007, the TV commercials for this were built around Pac-Man Jones, uh, who at this point was still booked for a tag title match, but was still under court order, not allowed to make any physical contact. They call him, quote, the most talked about man in professional wrestling today and push him as the biggest star on the show. And I guess when the commercials were first made, there was a lot of talk from the first media storm, but it's down to nothing now. In fact, the only reason people aren't furious in calling that TNA ripped them off on the last pay-per-view with Jones building a match and not having any physical contact in the match is because nobody bought the show or cared about him in the first place. So pretty critical words here from Dave Meltzer in the observer Pac-Man Jones, though, you had sort of maybe pulled the wool over our eyes on one pay-per-view. You're still promoting him. We hear that he can't through court order be contacted at all. Anyway, was the bloom off the rose? Was this like, man, it was a great idea. We just couldn't get out of the starting gates or how are you feeling about this as you head into bound for glory? I'm going to stay on point and not answer that question and go off point. What was your thoughts on the kind of the conversation of Ariel Hawani B. Owen? You brought up Meltzer and how critical he was. At, and just when, when you, I had a conversation, that's another beach conversation of how critical Meltzer was of the TNA days. Just, it was, uh, what did you used to tell me? TNA LOL. LOL TNA, yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, about, I, think, I think that's unfair. But I, I, to your point, I think a lot of it is is what we would call, and you and I have started to talk about this a little bit <clears throat> off air, the Meltzer effect, you know, like, and I, by the way, I'm a hook, line and sinker. I've been a subscriber since, well, 25 years. Wow. Uh, I read every single week for 25 years. So, but I also know that Dave has his opinions, man. And so like when wrestling fans get, and, and I've been guilty of this, when, when, I, when we get upset about how was that a so-and-so star match and not a such and so that's just his opinion, bro. And like when that clicks that it's not really this objective thing, it's just like one guy's opinion and he's just sharing his opinion. It's okay for him to have a different opinion. And I don't take it 
as personally, but I do feel like, you know, when, when the tone of this guy sucks or this guy's the best in the world, well, people really talk that way and they take it as the gospel. And I've been guilty of that because, you know, he is a, 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 a taste shifter, a taste shaper. So if he says something's good, I want to go check it out. You know, like uh, Megan and I will look at movies the same way. If we're not sure, Hey, should we watch this or not? If we see rotten tomatoes and it's like 95%, we're like, Oh, well, this is going to be good. Let's watch it. There's some sort of proof, you know, like when I buy something on Amazon, I'm going to look at, Hey, how, what's the average review? The old Donald Miller confirmation, confirmation bias. And or, yes. there's a couple of folks. Yeah. So let, let me ask you this. Here's where I was going with that. I'm kind of actually not defending Dave, but in a lot of ways, I, years ago when he literally wrote fiction on live events in Louisville and Evansville, and it was so far from the truth, obviously it was phone calls and it was secondhand way back then in a diplomatic way, I knew that Dave wrote a newsletter to sell subscriptions yes. because it was so, and I hats off dude making money. He's, he makes, he's doing all well. that. Yeah. yeah, he's do, 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 doing very well. My point being is, do you view Ariel different now that he VO'd a package for WWE? And he's obviously much more than a journalist. He's a friend of the family. Are you, are you saying Ariel Hawani? Yeah. I, he, knew when, I knew when he was interviewing Nick Khan and Triple H that he's co-opted. You don't sit down on camera. I'm with you with Nick Khan or, or triple H without being co-opted. They, they think you're safe. They think you're okay. That, that's cool. And by the way, why wouldn't they do that? Why would Literally you sit down 60 minutes every week? I'm not saying anything. Correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, I just, if, if, if Meltzer would, 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 to, would, and I, that's what I'm saying. It's, it's the online and you can call it a small vocal. You can call it whatever you want. But I, I, w- I want to mention our man works for Fox. WWE does business with Fox. Big time business. So I'm just saying if his boss came to him and said, record this, he's going to record that. But yes, I knew. Way back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I guess what I'm saying is that I didn't see, or maybe there's not, but I just thought, oh, now he's VO in packages. That's kind of, now you're creating uh scripted content a- as opposed to quote unquote playing the role of a journalist but well, if, but, if but Meltzer he... if Meltzer would have recorded a package for AEW don't you think the, as as you guys sometimes I chuckle at the internet would have melted and I know he's done docs for WWE and blah 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 I just it was I don't know maybe my slice of social media that I quickly scrolled through over the weekend I didn't see any negative feedback and I felt like, well, hang on now. Meltzer has Tony Khan on the show all the time. Oh, and Tony Khan goes on radio shows and says, yeah, wants to win Meltzer's booker of the year award. Yes. So they're friends. That's not a secret. Oh, no, 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 no. I, I, I guess. Maybe the expect, I don't want to say expect. Here's my question. Why didn't you do it? Do what? Your dad used to pick up the phone every week and call Wade. Why didn't you do it? Did you not see a benefit to Meltzer writing favorably? You liked reading the observer and him shitting all over you every week. I, that's what I'm saying. I didn't read it weekly. You, we talked about this. Well, no, I get that, but you at least knew that. I mean, your dad, you knew your dad called Wade. I'm just asking why didn't you you look and I've had a conversation with Mike Johnson, Wade Keller. I mean, many, many times, I I guess what I'm saying is I've always been bottom line driven pay-per-view buys, merchandise sales, hard tickets sold, whatever it may be. I didn't look at that as being a heavy influencer pre-social media. I just didn't. It's a game changer now. So I guess what I'm asking is, would you do, would you handle it differently now in the era of instantaneous information? If you're not connected, guess what? That means you're disconnected. Yeah. It, it's, I don't even think there's gray in it. I think it's black and white. I, I, going back to last week's conversation, 
get dialed in. The wrestling audience is online. When are they online? 24 seven. When are they most online? Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays, period. It's the, it's the, the, the data is right in front of you. I know we took a sidebar. I didn't mean for that, but yeah, it just, it's anyway, I, I, I just fascinating how things continue to evolve. So you, you, uh, you brought it up for a reason though, because we're, we're no. going over how Meltzer was really critical. Yes. Um, that's what I'm saying. He Dave in this 07, 08, 09, we were doing 1.8, 2 million viewers a week. And he consistently, okay. And here's another thing that's conveniently left out. The average of the spike primetime audience was around a million, million one. We, we weren't doubling it, but close. You can look at today's ratings and they're pretty much in line with network average. Brawl is above it. I know dynamite. They're both above it, but percentage wise. I, anyway, I just thought Dave was so, so you're saying you were nearly double what the station was averaging. We were all not, we weren't, it wasn't even a top 20 cable network, but yeah, these days the show, the wrestling shows are, are, are in within line of what the other shows are doing. Yeah. They're not double. And I know, I know you can't even compare because streaming and social media and YouTube, and I'm not comparing apples to oranges. I'm saying Dave just ripped us week after week after week. Did that sell him more newsletters? That's my question to you. I think now that we're pulling the layer of the onion and more layers and more layers. Cause I remember huh, I've got to read this research twice. Last week when you screwed up and wouldn't get in the topic, got long winded and had a nasal cold and cried and complained. And that was just straight. I'm kidding. <laughs> but no. So I, I, when I reread the notes, I go, Oh, there's Dave again, man. Why? I, I just, it's a question. It really now today, 15 years later, wonder why Dave, did Dave sell more newsletters by ripping us? Yes. Okay. Dave, 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 I think Dave needs to, um, and listen, he likes to make, he, he likes to be funny. He likes to, um, that's one I think, word I would never, uh, uh, well, no, I mean, he, he would write sarcastic sort of tongue in cheek. Funny. Oh yeah, 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 definitely. I mean, he likes that. And, and by the way, I do too. Like, I think it like there's value in it. I'm not being critical of that, mm -hmm. uh, but I also think that he has to have something to celebrate and then he has to have something to sort of. Oh, protagonist, antagonist. Yes, you know, yes, writing. yes. Yes, for sure. All right. So roll on. So Pac-Man Jones, at this point, my delusional optimism was maybe at its peak. Okay. Because, because Pac was in a situation where, and if you kind of go back in this time, he had no idea that he was going to go on to have a, another 10 years in the league. It, there was a chance that he would be out of the league. We'll say, the for for the foreseeable future which meant how's he gonna make money okay right. well he's tied up in litigation and i had a really good member on that other episode we did i drove uh, pac-man's pac-man couldn't come on titan facilities but i got his car on there and All i right. go in on a late night have that three four hour meeting and we left on Great terms is probably, but it was close to that kind, right? We, he, they understood that my goal is not to get Pac-Man hurt. Not matter of fact, that's the last thing I want to happen. Cause if he gets hurt on my dime, not only is it bad, negative publicity, hell, I can't make any money out of it. So I'm going to protect him. I mean, it, that once they kind of understood that uh, we'll say the, our goals were aligned. They just didn't want him hurt. They didn't really care about the chatter and all this. Hey, we've got this commodity that we've put on the shelf. Uh, and and we're hoping like hell that the case comes out. And, okay. They wanted him back on the field. This is a younger, they want him back on the field. And they didn't want him back on the field with a wrestling injury. Once I kind of aligned all that, I'm thinking in my delusional optimism, uh, uh, optimism mindset is, okay, I'll have him just do offensive moves. Ron can sell or this guy can sell or whatever. We'll creatively tell a storyline. It's happened my entire career. Hey, this guy's hurt when he shows up. He's got a bum knee. Okay, we're going to work around it. We'll have a match and it'll be dr drama and all the, you know, bells and whistles, but we're going to go out and tell a story and you don't have to have the five-star movement. So I was hoping Pac 
could get physical, but stay on offense. That's kind of the mindset that I kept going down that road with. And, and again, Dave saying we weren't getting any publicity. I don't necessarily, we put out 12 spots a year for in demand. One of every pay-per-view Pac-Man was in that spot was definitely, Oh, that's a different, Oh, that's wrestling. And of course we filtered in Kurt and sting and, or whoever else was on the card as well. So there's my pack positioning at this moment. I like it. Well, let's talk about somebody else who's trying to get in position. Don Marie is trying to get back into shape after having a kid and being almost 37 is now talking with TNA. There may be personal issues there with ex-boyfriend Pat Kinney as an agent, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. Dixie Carter and Don Marie have been friends ever since WWE fired Don while she was pregnant. And at the time, the talk was that if she wanted to return, she would have a job in TNA. We've not talked about Don Marie. What do you remember about her having conversations here? Casual conversations. I didn't really know uh, Pat's to this day's a very good buddy of mine. I, I didn't know all that dynamic and again, I'm into creative and production and talent and knew that I don't even think she is even ready to come back when she might be ready to come back. But I just knew and Dick, her and Dixie had a relationship over the drama and the fallout of her in WWE. That's all I, that's all I, I didn't even really care about it. It was a, a complete non-issue in my brain. So we talked about, uh, this transition from the one hour show to the two hour show. Well, the last one hour episode of TNA does not do well in the ratings. I also would say this TNA impact on nine twenty seven did a point nine one rating and 1.2 million viewers, a substantial 15% drop from what had been their regular viewership level. The show did a 0.56 in males 18 to 34 and 0.78 in males 35 to 49. So on the one hand, you got to be fired up. Holy shit. We're finally getting the second hour. I'm so excited. Damn. What happened to our rating here on the last one hour show? Any thoughts on that or no? I, I wish I would have give Derek a, a little heads up. This is because it popped in my brain. Was Thursday night football cranking up at this time? Yes. By in 07, it was right. Yeah. Yeah. At, at the, that uh, and the, the promotion and stuff like that. So that, that our Thursday nights were always a challenge and hell there's always competition that, you know, there Burger King and, and McDonald's are having two for one sales. There, there's always competition, but again, um, living and dying by ratings week to week, which internally in the office, there was a lot of that. If there wasn't something to, keep their focus on whether it's live events or international or marketing and, and on, uh, and on a Friday afternoon, the only thing that was going on is they're waiting on the ratings to come out. It, you, there was a, a much more of a chatter internally, but at this point, and look, of course we looked at them every week and we looked at the male demo. Most importantly, spike was a male network and that's all they really cared about because that's how they're selling their advertising dollars, but it dropping 15% is something that Dave needed to sell newsletters to oh, let's let's inflame this because it, it's good writing we didn't really now that would have gone on week after week after week of course it would have come but it was what it was but i have a feeling monday night or thursday night football uh could have impacted this somewhat don't miss lucha libre history order triple mania 30 now watch live and on demand anytime at watch triple mania.com because of the legend of the Villanos that started approximately 1970, he brought that legacy that the Villanos with the mask will endure for years. They are one of the beloved families of Mexico. And Villano IV uh, has proven through those first two chapters, wow, what a war with LA Park in Monterey and what a war with Psycho Clown. For him to go into the ring with Pentagon Jr., Pentagon Jr. will have to perform at the highest level if he wants to remain a masked luchador. 
I see Villano Cuatro, Villano Fourth, stronger. I believe that he has gotten that like new life. Like uh, you see his eyes, and he wants that moment. For Villano Cuatro to go into Arena Ciudad de Mexico on October 15 and defeat uh, Pentagon Jr., it's gonna be something fantastic for the chapter of the Villanos legacy. Monterrey, first chapter, Triple Mania, or second chapter, Tijuana. This is it, this is for all the marbles. One mask will fall on October 15. Arena Ciudad de Mexico, Triple Mania. And if you haven't bought your ticket and it's still left ticket, grab one because this is a once in a lifetime occasion. Villano Cuatro, right now, he's got that edge. And a veteran like him, you give him just a little edge, he'll take you down, your mask will come off. Talk to me a little bit about TNAU. It makes the torch. TNA announced a new college program called TNAU. They're looking for college students who are, quote, diehard TNA wrestling fans who want to work for TNA to help the company grow. What well, sounds like an internship is open to any college student with the incentive to receive, quote, special perks, perk. I'll get it right. Special <laughs> perks while gaining experience in the sports entertainment field. So those perks would have been like, what, get Jeff Jarrett's dry cleaning and things like that. Oh God almighty. Um, uh, it was an intern program trying to, and here's, this was kind of the fun reminiscing going through the research again, going from one to two hours, you know, again, we went one hour, got profitable, may started to make some hires internally. Then when you make a hire and maybe you hire a senior marketing person, then you can hire a junior marketing person. Well, that junior marketing person then can kind of take ownership and say, Hey, we need some assist, not assistance. We need some help. And so in Nashville, uh, we, several folks came through the MTSU middle Tennessee state university intern program, but we also wanted to branch out to colleges and in essence, whether you want to call them interns or street teams or, you know, influencers in the market, trying to create chatter and uh brand awareness with that male demo and the colleges were you know that that was the whole emphasis uh brand awareness with, with amongst the college kids well now it's time for us to tape our first two two-hour shows you're going to tape them on the 4th and the 11th of october uh, or, or i'm sorry that's when they'll air you're going to tape them on the 24th and the 25th right at 20 years right now wow. yeah and Meltzer says if there was big news, it was well, 15 years. Nothing that matters. Jesus. <laughs> if, if there was big news, it was that there was no big surprises. Instead of taping, uh, two tapings between three and 10 days ahead, as they'd been doing, they're working on a taping schedule of 10 and 16 days ahead. They'll go three to nine in 2008, but they're going either Every other Monday and Tuesday until the holiday season in December, the plan seems to have a three week taping break and coming back in 08 closer to the taping date. So I guess we're talking about how far in advance you're going to do it. Yada, yada. He says they did six matches in two hours. It was paced like a TNA one hour show, but just twice as long and really no different. But I think the big surprise here, he thought was, wow, you, you got two hours and there's no surprise. Were you working hard on surprises or was it just a function of, Hey guys, we've got pardon the expression, 10 pounds of shit in a five pound bag here. Let's just spread it out a little. First on the, I, and I always used to even somewhat internally, but it that we overcame that. But then also it was multiple folks were, were like, now what is your pay-per-view TV taping schedule. And if the calendar was pay-per-view on a Sunday and four weeks later, another pay-per-view and four weeks after that, no, that wasn't the reality because WWE back in these days, they had the priority. They got to pick their Sundays because it was on Sunday as when in Rome do his Roman. So we had to create our Sunday schedule around their Sunday schedule. 
So sometimes it would be four week arcs. Sometimes it would be five week arcs. Occasionally we would have to stretch it out and go six week arcs that literally dictated our taping schedule on a normal four week cycle cycle. We would do a pay-per-view on a Sunday. The next day on Monday, we would tape that Thursday show. And on Tuesday, we would tape the following Thursday show. If we needed to get three episodes in two days, we would tape one and a half and one and a half for the most part. So that was kind of the loop of the schedule that worked out, uh, not wearing talent out, not overexposing them individually in the impact zone per night, all that kind of stuff. But, um, that was kind of the, the, the rhythm of it. But as far as surprises, Conrad, we always were looking, you just do from a creative perspective, but you, you can't, that is very unsustainable. It's very, very difficult. And the marketing of it to me, you know, like on the white rabbit deal, it, it, you know, you, you sit back and look at it, they tease, 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 but they just didn't say tune into extreme rules. It is the biggest surprise or the biggest announcement or the biggest reveal. They just kind of kept chirping along and look, you can, you know, the Kurt Angle reveal for, for us, I thought was done well. There, we, you know, we did a couple of reveals and surprises. Well, the Lex Luger, I always go back to that. Him showing up on first nitro was like, wow, that really happened. So it's subjective, but we were always looking for surprises, but doing a two hour Conrad, I, I don't recall saying, Hey, we got to come up with a, a, a shocker. Of all the surprises you've seen in wrestling. How well blue chew works for your wiener's got to be near the top of the list, right? Here we go, folks. Tell us about the first time you took a blue chew. I know that you called me afterwards and you said, Conrad, Connie, that's what you called me. You go, Connie, I don't mean to brag, but it was so hard. Even a cat couldn't scratch it. Now I'm from Alabama and that's not a phrase I'm familiar with down here, but up in Hendersonville, what does so hard? Even a cat couldn't scratch it mean. <laughs> Did you tell us kitty cat? What's that? Do you have a kitty cat? No, I got the two dogs. You know, ginger and baby. I know ginger and baby. We've got a cat. Oh, really? Yes. Penelope. Okay. My cat. And there, you know, you, especially as kittens, you have to get scratching poles. Yeah. Because they have to, sh sh you know, uh, sharpen their, uh, claws, their gimmicks. Yeah. So you have to, the, the poles have to have a little pliability. If it's like not wood, I shouldn't say that this is a reed. Yeah. If like if it's marble, there's you, a cat can't get his claws into it. Hence he can't scratch it. Wow. And that's how hard blue chew will get you per Jeff Jarrett. The nights are getting longer. The breeze isn't the only thing that's getting stiff. It's also Jeff's crotch. That's right. This episode sponsored by blue chew guys. We all know confidence can take you far in life. Sometimes you can bullshit your way through life with some Bob Vila glasses and somehow still wind up world champion. It really is amazing. It's the story of my world. And it's the story of blue chew in the bedroom. When it's time to step up to the plate and you need to like crush her over the head with a guitar, blue chew can help. Blue chew is a unique online service that delivers the same active ingredients as Viagra and Cialis, but in chewable form and at a fraction of the cost. And you know, that's Jeff Jarrett's favorite part. He loves to save a dollar. You can take them anytime, day or night. So you can plan ahead or be ready whenever an opportunity arises. Maybe it's time to little cash in a little money in the bank contract on some, on some, well, you know, the process is simple. Sign up at bluechew.com, consult with one of their licensed medical providers. And once you're approved, you receive your prescription within days. And here's the best part. It's all done online. That means no visits to the doctor's office, no awkward conversations, no waiting in line at the pharmacy. By the way, blue Chew's tablets made right here in the USA. That's right. The good old red, white, and blue chew is prepared and shipped directly to your door, all in a discreet package. And if you could benefit from extra confidence in your wiener meat, when it's time to perform, chew it and do it. Here's what we're talking about. Guys have better sex. And we've got a special deal for our listeners. Try blue chew free. How much is it? It's free. When you use our promo code, my world at checkout, just pay the $5 shipping. That's bluechew.com. The promo code is my world. You'll receive your first month free. Visit bluechew.com for more details and important safety information. And we want to thank blue chew for sponsoring the podcast and Karen smile. Lord, can she smile? 
just grinning like a possum these days. Cats and possums and all kind of wildlife you're chattering up this morning. Oh, my. So the big rumor at the time was you guys were trying to make a play to get Chris Jericho. And over the years, we've heard this discussion a lot. And it always made me wonder, was he ever serious or was it always to try to get mo- get more money from Vince? What say you? Look, only Chris can answer this. Oh, that means you believe he was leveraging both sides. No, I, I don't. I, I honestly think uh, we had a lunch with him, Cheesecake Factory. And look, me and Chris had our live event matches and WCW matches and all that. Well, who, pick, who picked the Cheesecake Factory? I'm sure Dixie. You know, I don't know that. I don't know if it was convenient. I don't, I really, I have no idea. There's no chance that you were Chris picked the cheesecake. That, that makes sense. It would be Dixie. It's like, yeah. if, if you're eating a cheesecake factory, all the guys know it's some daughter's wish. I got you. some old lady's birthday. Like y- you and I or Chris Jericho are never intentionally picking cheesecake. Factory. No, that's, that's a fact. Well, I can honestly say that for myself. I, I, there's never in my life have ever <laughs> come back and say, you know what I want today? <laughs> I want to run down. To, Dad, honey, can we drive down to oh, Cheesecake Factory now? Yes. I've said that about Waffle House. I've said that about Cracker Barrel. Yes. I've certainly said that about Chop House. Yes. I say it often about sushi. Don't think I've ever said, man, I'm hankering for some cheesecake. It made me laugh that you said, oh, so we went with Chris at Cheesecake Factory. What? <laughs> if, someone, if you're thinking about doing a business meeting and they say, can we meet at Cheesecake Factory? You should think about charging them more. Or whatever you're going to go meet him up. <laughs> All right. Anyway, you meet him at Cheesecake Factory. What happens from there? Oh, a pleasant lunch and a bunch of niceties. But there was, I, I, I never thought for a second that he would consider. Right. Chris, smart dude. Uh, he's going to take a, a, I don't call it a photo op, but a, a, a cheesecake lunch, if you will, and move on down the road. And look. Chris has surrounded himself with agents and he's, you can tell by his, like, I'm not going to always say that I know his childhood, but when he got into the business, he was a thinker. It, it just, everything that goes with that. So, Hey, it's not a bad idea. A bad idea. Well, you know, it was in his hometown. The worst thing that can happen. The very worst thing that can happen is he got him a piece of cheesecake, <laughs> but I mean, it was, I, I never, thought hey, that's a good question one day maybe we'll ask him well i mean listen i think a lot of people assumed you know that this was always just to you know drive up the price for vince but the reality is he did wind up signing with aw and he's enjoying one hell of a second or third or whatever well, it is act we're, like we're 10 years removed now a different yeah. mindset I, I just think a lot of a lot of water went under that a uh, wwe bridge in a positive in a great way like yeah. what was left for him to do five years ago, four years ago, whatever it may be. He did yeah. the deal. So, yeah, uh, I, I, I guess what I'm asking is, did you think you needed, uh, for this two hour special, did you think you needed a big surprise or was I, this- I, I, did, I did not think, um, no, I did not think we needed it. And the reason being we were crammed full and, and maybe I was too close to the bubble, but I mean, you talk about a relief that now we can at least book guys and, and give the folks that, I mean, we were, we had way too much talent for a one hour show, just way too, way, way too. And now we're going to have a two hour show and we had Kurt and sting and we're going to be talking about the mafia. We had, you know, we had our veterans, yeah. we had our primetime players. I mean, AJ and Bobby Roode and Eric young and PD, all these guys coming into their own. I, I felt, would I have loved to have Chris? Hell yes. Did I think we needed a surprise? No, I didn't. Dixie is uh, doing a media conference call to highlight the two hour move. And here's some highlights about the TNA drug policy quote. We have an active drug policy in place that ha- prohibits the use of all illegal drugs. That of, cl- of course includes steroids. She said they review it regularly and consider it quote, a legal and moral responsibility. Jeff, not asking you to throw anybody under the bus here, but I don't believe that. Was that accurate here in 2007? 
Yeah, we, we there were infractions and there were penalties, and I'm definitely not going to throw anybody in the bus. But I'm going to go back to the Carter family, and um, you'll be better with dates. But there there was some look. I don't want to get, but yes, I mean it was very. Well, has she already been in front of Congress at this point? But it was a, definitely a conversation that was had, and we've got to put a policy in place, and we got to be smart about it with our dollars and cents. But the Benoit, and again, I don't want to put the cart before the horse and Eddie and all the different things that were going on. But Conrad, absolutely, we had um, we had a policy, we had random drug tests, and we had folks that uh, were financially penalized. Yes. She had not met with Congress by this point. Okay. But I, I, again, so that's why I didn't want to say it without complete, but it, there was, it was a, uh, it was taken very, very seriously, not just in Dallas, but in Nashville as well. Regarding the, uh, opportunity of competing on Monday nights, Dixie said this, that would be an ultimate goal. Obviously quote, she said they wanted to go to Mondays, but spike TV wanted Thursday nights to brand it. She said of all the time slot changes for them would have been a death knell for many shows, but they've succeeded, which to your point, you've said here before on the program, wrestling fans will find you, but the ultimate goal being to compete on Monday night. Did you believe that? Uh, not me. Yeah. Now, internally, we, you know, as you get into two, as we get into 2010, you'll, you'll see that I was big time overruled, but hearing the words come out of spike's mouth and their marketing, not just Kevin K from the top down, but we want to brand Thursday nights for us. That's big. That's coming from the asylum days. That's, that's a big. vote of confidence. Yeah. That's big stuff. That's big. I mean, it just, it just, it's big boy stuff. And, and, and no, we were not WCW and, and we kind of know, the history of that. Oh, it was great during the wars, but how long was that war? 83 weeks. You know, I'm, I'm saying that cause it's the term, yeah. but not long. Uh, talking about the free agents, she says, quote, there are several guys out there on the market who could do exciting things with TNA. She said regarding tomorrow night's show, what struck her is that the two hour this week features all the guys who brought them to the dance. She said, it's a testament to those who've helped get them to this point. But yeah, she's at least teasing. Maybe there's some folks out there. Was there a guy that you remember in this era really wanting and for whatever reason couldn't pull the trigger? I know you mentioned y'all at least had cheesecake with uh, Chris Jericho. Anybody else? Uh, uh, you know, I hate to say prime because look at him now. I mean, he's weekly. He's over delivering. Yes. Big time. Um, but so we'll say in this time, 15 years ago, Chris would have been more in his prime, if you will. Yeah. But yeah. today he, he's a, a guy that could be on every week. One off guys. Uh Hogan was out there. Goldberg was out there. Um those were the kind of folks that I thought could create brand awareness. Cause again, I mean, even when we went two hours, you would see because again. Before social media, you would, Hey, Oh, you're with TNA wrestling. Yeah. Y'all on spike. Oh yeah. Yeah. I've seen that. Wait, you're on two hours now. I didn't know that. It's just, it's consistency over and over and over and over. Very, very tough. You, it just to snapshot it. A lot of folks can't even really think about pre-social media days. Cause we're so far into it now, but it was tough getting awareness, but I thought a Pac-Man Jones, a Bill Goldberg, uh, you know, some publicity stunts. I know we did stuff later with Jersey shore, but I wanted to have consistent and I don't want to call them publicity stunts, but people that were outside the wrestling sphere that may bring in new audiences. That's, that was kind of my goal. Uh, when you said that line about, uh, you know, people that brought us to the dance, I know internally Vince Russo, Dutch Mantel, others, we were very excited that, Hey, these guys have busted their ass. I think we need to give them their flowers because they are the ones that really did bring us to the dance. 
she uh talked about the creative she said here's what she'd like to see changed longer matches and the ability to develop more characters she said there's so many talented guys on the roster who deserve time they were rushed in the past but we're slowing things down and quote this two-hour format will allow us to spread our wings and do what we do best and regarding criticism, she says, look at the number of people watching TNA versus two years ago. It was 800,000 and now it's grown to over one and a half in two years. Quote, that is a gigantic success story for any television show in any market. It's kind of hard to disagree with that. She was doing a nice job selling here. Was she not? Big time. Yeah. She, that's by trade. She is a PR pub. That's why I hired her. A PRJ. She's very good. Very, very good. And can craft script words. Uh, you're very good at that. Well, let's uh let's talk about the first two hour show. Rhino's gonna beat Black Rain. Raven's interference backfires, and uh they have Havoc and Jim Mitchell come out, and then Sting makes the final save. Sting's involved in this at the same time. Kurt Angle is stalking his son in California. It's an interesting approach to two hours here. All righty, Team 3D beats up the whole X division I mean, I mean, again. Getting out out of the uh, bro, we got to get out of the impact zone. We can't show two hours, which I agreed with for yeah. the most part. Go ahead. Uh, team 3d beats up Sanjay dot shark boy, uh, the champ Jay lethal. And then they call out Ron killings and Pac-Man Jones. And uh, then you begin the push for the women with the launch of the knockouts title. Gail Kim's going to beat Jackie Moore with Roxy and Christy Hemi at ringside. Somehow that leads to VKM Lance Hoyt, Jimmy rave and James storm all having to break the women up after a brawl. Uh, Killings and Jones are going to beat Team 3D to keep the tag titles, and I'll let the Observer take it away. For a long time, the idea was for Jones to do his first television match on the first two-hour show. Of course, by this point, nobody cares, but the idea stayed intact. Jeff Jarrett was making an attempt to go through the Tennessee Titans again this past week to get them to agree to let Jones to do more. Jones was in the ring but never touched, so Jarrett didn't get far. VKM interfered for the DQ and they attacked Killings. Pac-Man grabbed a chair and ran VKM to the back. This allowed 3D to beat up Killings until the Steiners returned to make the save. Any frustration here in the Pac-Man Jones thing, or is this about what you expected? My same delusional optimism. It just I was hoping, but you know, write the show and and we're 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 uh, I guess you could say the we were playing this out. Uh, getting to the pay per view and then over and done with. Uh, this is the build up for it. Again, I was trying to to make it work, and we never got through. Uh, Titans never budged at all. And Pac was listening to his, his attorney. It was a buddy. It was a unique time to say the least. Uh, Melzer would say in almost comedy, they did another gauntlet rumble match. It was a 10 man match with people entering every minute. It's the same type of get everyone on TV match where then nobody gets over. The only angle was the furthering of the Kaz, Mrs. Brooks, Robert root scenario. The last two were young and storm and it turned into a singles match with young scoring the pin. And the TV main event was Samoa Joe and junior Fatu and homicide and Hernandez. Against Christopher Daniels, Sinshi, Christopher K, Christian Cage, and AJ Styles. They go 15 minutes. It's excellent live. Meltzer says it'll be heard on TV because of the commercial breaks, but that's the reality of doing a long match on Spike. Hernandez does a big dive over the top. Joe pins Sinshi clean with a muscle buster. But look at that talent, man. Samoa Joe, one of the best in the world in this era. Junior Fatu, who we know is Rikishi, fresh off a big TV run. Homicide, one of the stalwarts of TNA and certainly the independence for many, many years. Hernandez, who a lot of people think, man, he could be the next big thing. Christopher Daniels, who's a, a TNA original OG who we know can go bell to bell. Sinchi, maybe the biggest upside of anybody in the ring, you think, at one point. Christian Cage, my goodness, Hall of Famer, bona fide, first ballot dude. And then AJ Styles on the short list of the best wrestlers of all time. This is all in the main event, but it does feel a little bit like we're cramming a lot of stuff in here. 10 man main event. 
or an eight man main event, 10 man gauntlet. We're trying to, I, I understand. Hey guys, we got two hours, but it almost feels like let's see how much we can cram in again. Right. I hear you. The other side of that corn is uh coin is this is the first paragraph of the two hour era. If you will. Yeah. Let's roll out the stars and Dave's negative connotation. Nobody gets over who said that we're going to say, we're going to get this guy over. We wanted to get the brand over and you just kind of gave the validation. Let's show all the talent that this brand has. Well, let's talk about what's going on behind the scenes, because this is way more interesting. Oh, here we go. Behind the scenes, the conflict between Kurt Angle and Jeff Jarrett, basically for Dixie Carter's ear affections or whatever you want to call it. Can, now, can you footnote what date month this is? Cause I think it's it. People can get confused. Hang tight. Yep. Behind the scenes, the conflict between Kurt Angle and Jeff Jarrett, basically for Dixie Carter's ears, affections, or whatever you want to call it, grew significantly over the past week. There was a big company party thrown by Spike on September 24th after the first two-hour taping with everyone drinking champagne and celebrating. Pac-Man Jones had $501 bills and was making it rain money, which nobody said anything about because who needs to be in the line of fire? But it showed that any idea he's learned anything or changed is out the window. The main thing was behind the scenes. Jarrett's allies, most notably BG James, were talking to various wrestlers, pretty much wanting them to choose sides. A few people have mentioned feeling there is pressure to pick sides, and in doing so, you have a 50% chance of screwing yourself. A few people have their loyalties to Jarrett, like BG James, Jeremy Borash, Abyss, Dutch Mantel, and others. The rest want to pick the side they think wins at the end. It's described as the Angle family and Russo against Jarrett and Dutch Mantel, both when it comes to booking, but also long-term power. Kurt has made no bones over the fact he wants to be running the company with Dixie, which puts him in direct conflict with Jarrett, who is a minority owner and has steered the ship from day one. The end result here is hard to predict because there's no way Kurt is going to either be removed from the company for any reason nor removed from the top, which is normally the goal in a conflict like this. There are also conflicts between the sides and different opinions over who to push. Angle wants to go with younger talent, and Jarrett has always had the mentality that experience and knowledge and working and not flying moves is what counts, and their veterans are the ones with that experience. Plus, he thinks people who've had years of national television have the star power because the young guys don't move the ratings. But the flip side is that people who aren't pushed never move the ratings. So it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy, but they have pushed Joe, maybe not as smart as they should have. And he's never been given the run as the top guy, but he is a top guy. And Joe was fresh, a good talker, great worker, and really never proved to be a ratings mover. Of course, neither have sting or angle after their first, uh, first few appearances. And Jarrett has been behind junior Fatu and team 3d because they've had years of TV being in the first two hour show main events. However, Jarrett sees the X division guys as undercard filler, but Russo has the mentality of all the run in finishes, even though angle his ally likes cleaner finishes guys. I have never in my life imagined that there would be a scenario where Vince Russo and Kurt Angle were on the same side of things. And here they are, according to the observer, and digging their heels in against Jeff Jarrett and Dutch Mantel. So that's the full report from the observer. You were there. What say you, Jeff? What do you remember of this? Funny how you roll things out and make comments. Can you uh kind of restate you never thought you'd see the day that Vince Russo, Russo and Kurt Angle were aligned in their views on wrestling, like Okay. I didn't, I didn't imagine that that was the circle. I don't think they were aligned. They were aligned in one thing. They didn't want Jeff running the show. Uh, they were aligned because Dixie. Hey, Vince, don't you think we need more character development? Well, if you say so, Dixie, yep. Hey, Kurt, don't you think he's the wrestler? Don't you think we need more long matches? Well, yes, ma'am. 
those two guys were just pawns for Dixie Carter. Okay. I could not believe the reports that about that, you know, I can't pinpoint the date and the time and all this right, but right. During this time when I'm thinking to myself, Kurt, I'm the one who hired you. I, I'm the one that Dave Hawk came to me and now you're jockeying. And I know Dixie is manipulating and positioning and maneuvering because, Hey, we went from Saturday nights on spike to Thursday night, late night on spike to one hour in prime time, now to two hour. And now the money is, I don't say rolling in, but it was comparatively speaking. And then the international deals, Hey, this looks easy. Let me run the show. And this was the beginnings. Now she succeeded at the end of 09, 2010, but this is beginnings of the, the, the power play. And I could not believe Kurt. And at the time, Vince, I had people on creative telling me Vince is talking to Dixie every week. Vince is talking to Dixie every week. Vince, is, It's okay. Dixie's just calling and they're just chatting and this and that. And then when things became a little bit more, I just, I, I, I repressed it. I'm like, surely Kurt ain't going to try to screw me. Surely Russo, does Russo really want to write the show by himself? Does he think? Yeah, he did. But no, that's that was exactly what was going on. I don't think a lot of this has ever been discussed. I mean, you've never talked about it, right? No, no I mean, not not in depth, but no. But I I kind of follow your lead, pal. As we get into episodes, and and uh, <laughs> I guess what I'm what I'm driving at here is this is a circumstance where, and I'm not trying to put words in your mouth. I'm just wanting to make sure I got the story right here. It sounds as if this whole report that there's like two sides is real. Like a lot of times you debunk what we go over on the observer here and you say, well, that's fiction that that helps sell newsletters, but you really do believe in hindsight. No, this was real. This was really happening. So two sides means that the, the talent, they wanted to get paid. They knew that there's no upside to they put that right. I don't believe for a minute Brian Road Dog was going around politicking or campaigning or soliciting information or answers and none of that. I think that's fictitious. Now, Brian could probably answer. But now, at the same time, he might not be saying, are you on this side or are you on that side? But it is. I, I'm not saying Brian did this. Yeah, 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 yeah. But a, a topic of I, conversation. I can see him yeah. just dunking on the other side. Oh, for sure. Like he's a, he's a witty, funny, sharp oh. devil. So I'm sure if he had a fun one-liner about Russo or Dixie or angle that, that joke was told and, and, and from the outside, it would be clear. Oh, well, he's with Jeff. Oh, a hundred percent. As yeah. we say here for all the, I mean, I think, uh, we, we got into the story like Scott Steiner didn't have that wit or the, 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 the the democracy. He just went up to Dixie and said, Dixie, you start running the company and let Hulk Hogan run the company. You're going to go out of business. Brian said, kind of said it very, very, wait a minute. (laughs) Kurt had never written a wrestling show in his life and would tell you, I don't want to write the show. Uh, That Kurt worries about Kurt. I mean, that, but that, and, and Vince, Hey bro, you go do your in-ring stuff. I just, I'm a writer. I'm a writer, but Dixie literally trying to maneuver. I'm going to get a writer and a wrestler. And this is going to be, I mean, that's she, you know, look, hindsight's 2020, but these were the beginning days of her wanting me out. I got you. When did you first suspect, Hey, wait a minute. If we were really partners. She wouldn't be doing that. When did you first think? I don't know that this is a real partnership. I think she wants me out. Do you remember? Was there a particular incident? Uh, Dean Broadhead had a couple of conversations with me that I don't think he understood what, what I was actually like, Oh, okay. So this is how it is that Dixie wouldn't be an honest with Dallas. I'm like, Oh, okay. So that means ego is more important than bottom line. You know, it it was, it was an example. What was she being dishonest about? Um, a 
budgets, maybe not actuals, but budgets, um, just the day-to-day of Help, help me help me understand. She would submit a fake budget. No, God, no, 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 no. J- j- just everything's fine and dandy. And, and let me do a better, uh, descriptor here. J- just I'm, I'm really trying to think of a good example of, I mean, Dean had, had Dean had shared with me a couple of times. Dixie doesn't want Dallas to know, and I know that sometimes you, in the course of business, look. The investor doesn't need to know anything other than I'm getting a return on my investment or not. But for, for the most part, as yeah. long as you don't do anything illegal or unethical, right? But 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 in the day to day course that, so she didn't communicate that maybe the company was in trouble. In no, times where maybe she should. Well, that's that. That came us later, but but something to the fact that, hey, Russo and 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 uh, and Kurt, they they're really um, they're not so high on Jeff. They 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 they, they think he probably is uh, not a good writer or not a good this or not. And and really, Kurt and Russo probably didn't say that, but. Again, leading the, leading the witness. Dixie would lead the witness. Hey, Kurt, you want more long matches, longer matches than you are having not right now on TV. Of course, I'm writing the shows or ultimately responsible. So she takes Kurt wants longer matches and turns it into Kurt doesn't think Jeff's a good uh, booker writer. And and Dean would kind of say this is how the and I'm not that that's specific instant, but twisting the truth. And she would, I mean, she. Again, hindsight's twenty twenty. She would prop herself up and take digs at me over and over and over and over. But what what what's her motivation for doing that, Jeff? What like ego? Ego. She wanted, in your opinion, that's what we're talking about now. To, in my opinion, she wanted to run the show from the very beginning. Had no idea why. Why? Because here's where it was validated in November of. 2013 the company is in a death spiral it is torpedoing toby came and said look you can stay on but you can't run the show anymore we've seen the results of that she would rather go out of business than give up control that's proof i i can sit here today and say that i had no idea she would take it to that length at this time, certainly we're talking oh seven oh you know oh seven oh eight here. I'm just thinking, okay. I really want to talk about 2013, but we don't need to get sidebarred. Oh, uh, so <laughs> it's reported four days later, Kurt Angle was arrested at his residence on September 28th, according to police in Pennsylvania. A woman driving by a local bar reported to police that an SUV was driving erratically while leaving the bar. Police traced the license plate number to Angle and went to his residence to administer a sobriety test. Police say they smelled liquor on Angle's breath and he had anti-inflammatory pills in his mouth as they questioned him. He was then taken to a local hospital where he refused a blood test. The refusal led to an automatic one-year suspension of Angle's license. According to the local CBS affiliate in Pittsburgh, Angle will be required to attend a court hearing on, quote, Charges of driving under the influence of alcohol or a controlled substance and careless driving. Well, boy, this is less than ideal news for your top star here. Uh, and it's obviously something that you're close to these days. What do you remember thinking about, man, I hope our man's okay here. Cause this has to have you at least a little concerned, right? In the creative room, devastated might be too strong, but we were down yeah we were down big time like oh my god um again the delusional optimism he's got this under control he's okay all this when this came out it was just like you know there was there was no anger no it's just like geez um and then you know the stories as 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 that not stories story filtered out hey it's gonna be okay he's 
going to lose his driving privileges. He's not going to jail. Uh, it, it, all that kind of stuff. We were concerned personally. Uh, and, and also, it, it, I mean, the obvious, what's Spike going to think? What's yeah. Bob Carter think? Those two things. That's the first thoughts that went through my mind. Fortunately, unfortunately, I'm being as honest as I can here. When that came out, I went, oh, my God. Is he okay? <laughs> went through the safety. Is he all, all that? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I'm going to lose his license probably or whatever. And then the next thing you hear is, they, they, they you think he is. Jesus. We're just getting to two hours, and the guy that everything is centered around in Spike's eyes the Olympic gold medalist, Kurt Angle, in this. Talk to me a little bit about, you know, who from TNA speaks to him. Like, Dixie, does somebody reach out Dixie, in official Dixie, capacity? Dixie, in the in the PR mode, not just externally, but internally, she ran point on all that. what was Dixie saying to you about all of this, if anything, or is, at this point, or is your relationship with her? Oh, no, and it was, no, oh, it was, it was still, I mean, fine community. I mean, yeah, fine communication. And she painted a very optimistic picture. Everything's going to be okay. And da, 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 da. Okay. Now to her credit, she wanted to paint that rosy picture to her family and to spite. Okay. I just, just want to keep everybody, you know, time, it's a funny thing. So I just want to add context to this. I'm not comparing the two, but wrestling got a black eye in a major way a few months prior to this because of the Chris Benoit double murder. And obviously there's more to life than wrestling. F wrestling, two people lost their lives. And now there is more scrutiny over what's happening in this wrestling space. Is this cultivating a bad circumstance for the folks who work within it? Et cetera, et cetera. That's in June. Here we are at the end of September, and we have our world champion, the face of our company now. Because we could say beforehand, that's not us. He never worked here, all that stuff. And now it's our world champion, not being in trouble for the same thing, not comparing that, but he's at least making the wrong kind of headlines. Fair to say? Yeah. And internally, when Kurt came on board, he would openly discuss his, uh, opioid or pain pill addiction. Yeah. And it was in his rear view mirror, you know, that, that this is what he's come out of and God, you know, that's the way things used to be. Da, 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 da. Yeah. 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 And now this drop in his, in all of our laughs, it was, he was not good. Uh, on any level. And again, put it in context that the lead up to this time, and this just didn't happen overnight. Dave said it took a turn for a worse. The Russo Dixie Kurt Funk mess had been baking quite a while. Talk to me about where your head is at personally here in 07 fall of 07 what's going on in jeff jarrett's life besides maybe hearing am i getting pushed out of my own shit here like just in your real life what was 07 like for you kind of right it look and maybe it's not the, the time or my, my my gut but this was the first of a lot of things the first time the girls went to school without a mother, the first birthdays, the first holidays, the first, the first, the you know, uh, first day of school, uh, first parent teacher conferences without first, mom, all of that. Yeah. yeah. It's a lot. And then by the way, we got our first two hour show October 4th, did a 1.06 rating 1.5 million viewers. So impact outdrew the ultimate fighter. It has a 0.83 in males, 18 to 34, 0.77 in males, 35, 49. It's uh, a 1.05 in male teenagers. Big difference between TNA and UFC. UFC is not pulling numbers from teenagers, uh, but it does double the 18 to 34. But man, to outdraw the ultimate fighter, this is a big doggone deal. It's got to make you 
strut that ass a little bit. Some good news. It was it was just the demo, the demo, the demo. And you know, when we you know, when we got on in prime time, you could really hear marketing and Kevin K and just the Brian Diamond and Scott Fishman, how they dialed into males eighteen forty nine, males eighteen thirty five. Then you go to two hours and and that then all of a sudden you know, they, they sell their primetime average in three hours, you know, three hours of primetime. It just was, it, TNA became an even, a much bigger asset because, okay, they proved they've wanted this two hour deal. Is it really going to work in two hours? Are they going to be able to sustain their audience? Yes, yes, and yes. It was huge. It was huge, Conrad. Just because they had invested in us and they had more than, as I've said multiple times, they essentially doubled and then plus our revenue, but we didn't double our expenses. Huge. Here's the trouble. You're trying to do back-to-back tapings. So you're going to t- try to tape TV for October 11th, the next day. And you only have 400 people there. And Meltzer would speculate that doing multiple nights back to back from the same location is going to make it a, a tough situation to draw. Was that a reality check for you? I mean, you got to feel really good about shows are good. They're well reviewed. People are watching. Damn. We can't get more than 400 people in here. Shit. That's like less than ideal. Not on our first Tuesday. I never was like, ah, oh. Again, you just kind of got to know the DNA of Universal Studios that you're going to have a park audience, which yeah. are all that, but you also you got to have your regulars. So in this case, you got to get them to come back to back or different. They got to make a decision, but also just the marketing and awareness. You know, we had our pit and we had our crew of hundred and whatever it may be that were there at every show. But then the, the rest of the arena, they come twice a month or once a month or whatever it may be it, it look and and was it optimal no but i didn't hit the panic button and say oh my god we're never going to be able to do that others like to hang the studio as an excuse it's again i got lucky there's a lot of sellouts drawn drawn in the 70s and 80s with 150 people in memphis studio audience so i was Again, this isn't meant the studio offense. Hey, we didn't talk about Tales of the Territory. Maybe we'll hit that next week because we got to keep rolling. But, uh, but you know, seeing that Memphis studio audience and the Galento story done in a studio. But, no, I wouldn't panic on the 400 at all. So the new show starts, uh, the second set of tapings. We start with Kurt and Karen fighting in the ring. A sting dummy is dropped from the ceiling. It freaks Kurt out. Uh, Chaos comes out to save Tracy Brooks from Robert Rude, treating her like shit. Uh, Pac-Man comes through and, uh, well, he's going to be teaming with Ron Killings to take on Sinchi and Elix Skipper. Pac-Man's moving this match. He throws a football at Loki's ding dong. I'm sure Loki loved that creative. <laughs> uh, the ref stops him from dropping an elbow. He's not the legal man. So he throws some $1 bills in the air. That's right. He makes it rain and killings gets the pinfall win. As a reminder, Pac-Man's in trouble for a shooting at a strip club. And now he's here throwing it money and making it rain and throwing footballs at low key's ding dong low key couldn't have been thrilled with this creative. How in the world did you get him to agree to do that? Oh, Brandon was all right. Most, I mean, he Brandon low key was low key. I mean, he's that line of, you know, I think sometimes now as the legend grows, he was always hard to deal with. That wasn't the case. I always personally got along really good. I I kind of respected his um, mentality, if you his, will. His passion. His passion. But he would bend with it. He absolutely would bend with it. Not all the time, but a lot of the time. All right. Well, there you go. He was cool with taking the football to the ding dong. Bingo. Um, Christian is uh, going to come out with AJ Styles. Before they come out, Jeremy Borash primes the crowd, telling them if they boo Christian loudly enough, some fans will get to go backstage and meet the wrestlers. So it's a talk show segment here called the peep show. And it's all made up to look like a Samoan party. Joe comes out. They argue. Christian said they should have a toast as styles pours them two glasses of margaritas. Joe throws his in Christian's face. They brawl, destroy the set. Matt Morgan, carry styles to the back. 
And then Christian hit Joe with a coconut. Meltzer would say the coconut forgot to break. So I think everyone listening to this is aware and familiar with the Roddy Piper snook a coconut thing. Russo, are really a big fan of that segment. What are we doing? I guess uh, when I read that, I, I vaguely remember it, but I, I do remember the peep show. And uh, I guess the thing I like the most about it is, is JB look to part guests who don't know our storylines at all. Okay. Uh, it came across when you say that in the commercial break, when you come on TV, you see the studio audience booing the hell out of Christian. The vibe worked. Next up, we've got Raven and Rain beating Rhino and Abyss in an ODQ match. We've got tables, garbage cans, and thumbtacks all used in a TV match. That's to build up a monster's ball match on pay-per-view. Uh, and then it's time for our main event. It's Kurt Angle in 3D over LAX and Fatu. Uh, Morgan is at ringside as the enforcer. Uh, one of the Latino Nation guys was Sting in disguise. He lays out Angle and puts him in a Scorpion Deathlock. Uh, and that's our, our main event as we're so, uh, sort of getting ready for the big pay-per-view here and coming out of the show, we'll get this note. Steve is telling everyone he's retiring at the end of this year. Some in the company believe he's saying that thinking he can get a raise from Dixie Carter, who is strong on keeping him, even though at the end of the year, Jarrett wasn't high on signing him for another year because they had angle and because whatever drawing power sting had seemed to dissipate. Plus, Sting didn't work house shows or the international dates. Carter was said to be very upset when Sting was saying he was only going to fulfill this contract, and that's it. Well, of course, we're 15 years later. He's still wrestling for AEW. Right on. How important was Sting for Dixie? He was important to, to Dixie, myself, really all of us, even in creative. But, but this is where, okay, this may be kind of example that – I would hear from, uh, I'll say Dallas could, it, cause, cause it could have been from an attorney. It could have been a multiple sources, but uh, you can't afford, uh, you know, the, the talent budgets, this, okay. So sting salaries, this, if you pull that out, we can make budget. If you don't, we're not going to make it well, uh, Dixie, you've kind of answered the question for us because yeah. she would say, do you want sting or not? I'm like, if we can afford him. Hell yeah, we want him. Yeah. What, what What is the cards, deck of cards we're playing with? Well, this, this, and this. And I'm like, well, Dixie, there's no way we're going to be able to give this guy a raise. He's coming up March. This guy's got coming up June. This guy's coming up September. If we're giving those guys even a 10% bump, then the numbers don't work. So you're kind of answering it. This is a numbers game. Okay, go back. Well, creative won't sting. Well, Dixie, I told you we ain't going to go over this number. Well, I'm, it's just kind of the shell game that went on and on and on. So Dixie liked to have the good news, but wouldn't deliver the bad news. But we got Sting re-signed, and I love it that he's still kicking ass <laughs> in AEW. But back then, in Sting's mindset, I think Sting just said, if I'm leaving my house, I want to get paid well. And if y'all don't want to pay me well, okay. I'll stay home. He was much more cut and dried for Sting. Meltzer would say this. The showdown or power play could go down as soon as this weekend. Many of TNA's top stars, top stars were talking this week about taking a united front to Dixie Carter to insist that Jeff Jarrett and Dutch Mantel be removed from booking. Now, you know how united fronts are in wrestling. If they're successful, the power in the company would be Angle and Vince Russo and I don't know that that's an improvement. So do you remember hearing this that, Hey man, there's a little groundswell of support. They're trying to get rid of me in old Dutch over yonder. JB Dutch and others would say, I'm telling you Russo's campaigning. I'm telling you. And I said, is Russo campaigning or is Dixie campaigning through Russo? You know, like what, what, what is it? I, I do think there's kind of a difference there. If, if, if Dixie, I knew that, you know, I was certain because I could ask Dixie certain questions and she just by her non-answers or her, her evasive answers, I go, okay, she's politicking. But when it came right down to it, I knew my relationship with Bob 
and and okay, we're are you happy with this investment so far? Well, yeah, we're making money now. Now we're on two hours. But she would get into the politicking and keep moving and keep moving. But as far as a big showdown, I didn't think that would happen at all. Did, did you, I mean, listen, the narrative in the observer was always, oh, the guys are upset because Jeff keeps pushing himself. Hell, I'm not even on TV at this time. Well, that was my question. What is the issue now? If it's, uh, the, the, if the knock on you forever was, well, he's just pushing himself. He's making himself champion. If you're not on the show, why are they still, what, what, what's the, what's the gripe now? I would love for you to ask Vince Russo that question. Because how do you make, the, look, somebody's got to be a boss. Somebody has, the buck has to stop. They didn't like it that the buck stopped with me. And, but you hit the nail on the head. It's like, Kurt, you left WWE. Dave Hawk called me. We hired you. Your schedule is a 10th of what it was at WWE. You're making a boatload of money. And you want Dixie Carter to to write the show that you're, or, or you write the show, Vince. You 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 really want the whole ball of wax, and you want Dutch and JB and whoever Bill Banks. Y'all want us just all out of creative, Abyss and Mike Tanay, and I don't know if Scott Demore. I think he'd left at this time, but all this, like, what do you want? I just didn't think that they were going to push it that far. I put it into in my brain. Dixie wants a power play. She wants ego. She wants to run the show. But does she really? Yeah. His mess. Don't miss Lucha Libre history. Order Triple Mania 30 now. Watch live and on demand anytime at watchtriplemania.com. It's about what Lucha is. Lucha is huge in Mexico. Lucha, you have villains, you have uh, heroes, and the champion, even, even our most important championship. It's called the Mega Championship. When you become the Mega Champion, you become the man. You are the champion that everybody gets because in, in Mexican cultura or lucha cultura, the Mega Championship is not defended on every pay-per-view, on every card. No, it has to be a special moment. It has to be a special challenger. We have Phoenix and Hijo del Vikingo. Phoenix, you already know us, Lucha Brothers, some of the better and fantastic matches that AEW has had has been with the Lucha Brothers. So you're coming to a big main event in Triple Mania's uh, 30th anniversary. You have an ex-Mega Champion, because Phoenix had already conquered that championship, and he has said to Hijo del Vikingo, you're good, but you're not Phoenix. The promo that Hijo del Vikingo did today, to me, was something that has never been done. He sat down in the turnbuckle, and then he just opened up his heart and said, I dreamed of becoming the mega champion. And on that day, October 15, I'm not going to admire you as I do now. I'm not going to respect you as I do now, Phoenix. It's you and me, mano a mano, and the goal stays with me. If you have not seen Hijo del Vikingo, let me tell you, this guy, it's unbelievable, unbelievable. And when you put Phoenix and him together, it's Triple Mania. They are gonna give you the best match that you have ever seen in your life. And that is for the Mega Championship, or in Spanish, Mega Campeonato, Hijo del Vikingo versus Phoenix. Last year's Bound for Glory with Kurt Angle's debut for your NWA title uh, versus Sting's career drew 55,000 buys. This year, the show does 40,000 buys. It doubles what No Surrender did, but it's still down pretty significantly. Meltzer would say, build is TNA's biggest show of the year, the Bound for Glory pay-per-view featuring the pay-per-view singles match of Kurt Angle versus Sting held on October 14th in suburban Atlanta at the Gwinnett Center was a great show and a sobering reality check. Watching on pay-per-view, it was one good to great match after another with incredible crowd heat. There was less of the overbooking that has plagued TNA in the past. Granted, 
two battle royal type matches on the same show was overkill and the Kurt and Karen angle pretending to be on the verge of divorce only for it to be a swerve leading to screwing the baby face in the main event was a tired repeat saved only because Kevin Nash did a great job in his recurring role as the broken down former star. But the worst thing on the show was the reality of the crowd. TNA supporters can bask in the glory that as one regular Atlanta fan after another noted, the 4,000 fans in the building were making considerably more noise than triple that number of people for a WWE raw show that has been made in the same market. But 4,000 people is not a good number when they spent the last week heavily papering the city. They also did a gimmick where Pac-Man Jones had legitimately purchased 1500 tickets to give to schools for prizes for the best students. Jones has been given the impression that commissioner Roger Goodell wants him to do something for the community before being reinstated. There's some question as to whether buying the tickets for kids for a wrestling show that can't really sell them fits into that category, but that's for him to decide. So let's talk about it. 4,000 fans is a, a good crowd then now forever. But Meltzer is pretty critical of it here saying, oh, well, there's a lot of paper. Do you remember being disappointed in 4,000? No. So what did he say paid was? He doesn't say here. Okay. Uh, that's, that was kind of my point. I would love to dig up my numbers. I've got to, but. M Meltzer I says they should have been pleasantly surprised by those who came, but anything under 4,500 paid for the biggest show of the year. Okay. I, versus I, I think TNA. paid was over 4,000 paid. Okay. I think it was kind of like. Damn, because we did. We we put out a lot of tickets. It, it, it papering is one thing, but the children's clubs, the all those like the TNAU that came in, and Atlanta's not far from Nashville, obviously. But we wanted to get free tickets in underprivileged folks that could not afford them. We yeah. we we didn't want to just start blanket. We and we thought. <laughs> that we really did a hell of a job and got a lot of that out though. They just didn't come. The TNA faithful came and were loud as Dave. I mean, they, they all, everything that went with it, but we spent a lot of bandwidth that we probably shouldn't have that that's on us because it just wasn't, you know, we were hoping to get seven or 8,000 in the building or 6,000 or whatever it may be. Really at the end of the day, whether it was Dallas or Dixie or ourselves or whatever, that, that we weren't tracking the amount of soul, but in reality, okay, we got over 4,000 paid. That ain't bad. Suburb of Atlanta, Gwinnett, great building, blah, 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 blah. Uh, but the pay-per-view buys is the thing that I do remember months later when all this came in and you just look at it. And again, oh, why is Al Dutch Mantel, Jeff? Where's the heat? Well, yeah, Dutch, we had a good story. Okay, great. Good story. Maybe it works for TV, but Kurt, Karen, Sting, wh wh where's the heat? The year before, people, I had legit heat. <laughs> no, people wanted to see Sting beat me for the title. That was the story. We didn't have that this year. Although I thought, look, I'm as guilty or the most guilty. That main event didn't draw like the one the year before. It just didn't. Let me, let me just give some context here through the year. This is the whole calendar year, January, 35,000, February, 25,000, March, 30,000. We leave Orlando and in April, we're in St. Louis in front of 6,000 fans, 35,000 back in Orlando in May, 25,000. We were in Nashville in June. There's 3,500 fans there, 25,000 on pay-per-view. Down to 20 in July, 25 in August, 20 in September, 40,000 here in Duluth, 4,000 fans in the building. And then we round out the year with 25,000 in November and 30,000 in December. So no matter how we slice it, this is the second biggest live crowd of the year. And this is the most pay-per-view buys of the year, 40,000, but that's the new ceiling and the following year, you only beat that one time and it's for lockdown and lower mass. It does 55,000. So it's not terrible. I mean, your best show in 2010, by the way, is 39,000, but you're averaging way, way less. 
Your low in 09 is 7,500 for final resolution. You only have two times where you hit 40,000 once with lockdown, once with Genesis. I'm just saying 40,000 is a big number and it's a record for the year that year. How about that? Yeah. But, but, uh, I know we were very, very bullish. We were very optimistic. The Kurt Karen Sting story, the undercard. Look, people were, and with, and, and rightly so, uh, at, at times the Pac Man, but just getting chatter and all of that. Uh, the 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 full card was really good. I thought we're going to run through that before we I, do. I, I want to run you through this, even with two hours of prime time and its biggest event of the year, with its two biggest mainstream names on top. TNA has a surprisingly small fan base willing to attend a live event and keep in mind, several hundred of those fans came from around the country. Those that do may love the product, but there aren't enough of them bound for glory. The premier event of the year. It looks like the pay-per-view numbers are going to be a major disappointment and nowhere near the level they were doing a year ago, even with a better time slot and more viewers that becomes even more disappointing. Because Sting and the Steiner brothers, who were the top stars during the early years of WCW when it was based in the city, were the headliners. It's probably been six or seven years since Sting worked in Atlanta, a city he headlined regularly for about 13 years, often as the main event babyface and the world champion. He didn't always draw on top in WCW, but there should have been some type of a nostalgia draw here that just didn't happen. That's with tons of media work in the chicken or the egg. The fact was the crowd was super hot from the start of the show. Perhaps they spurred the wrestlers on, or the reason they stayed hot was because most of the matches were good, but they should have been pleasantly surprised by those who came, but anything under 4,500 paid for the biggest show of the year and angle versus sting shows TNA is really weaker than we figured or the sometimes numbingly bad overbooking has negated any name value drawing those two once had. So that's interesting because I think it's easy for us. And there's correlations with today and what's happening in 2022. And you can draw your own conclusions there, but it is interesting to say, Hey man, they threw everything at this, including the local boy coming home, the former star being, you know, back on top after this long absence, we got two hours, we got big talent and we're not really growing. Does it make you feel a little, I told you so about the sting thing or take me through how you received that report from Dave Meltzer. It was disheartening on the bias. Now, again, I've said this multiple times, hindsight's 2020. I had no idea of the phrase. I call it the Apple wallet generation where you can just buy anything on a phone. And these days you still had to sit down with your remote and hit impulse and hit buy. And that's your transactional pay-per-view. There wasn't no streaming service. There wasn't a fight. You had to go in demand dish or direct. And so the process was in what it is today. And WWE was still doing their monthly pay-per-views yeah. and grantedly. Uh, you know, this is, I mean, you can, you, you can pick your star taker, Sean, Cena, uh, you know, whoever you want to say in Oh, seven, Oh, eight, nine. I mean, their product was exponentially hotter than ours. Uh, and you know, we had, uh, it, look, uh, we can come up with a million different, they're all excuses. I just thought from a transactional pay-per-view basis, Based off last year, 55,000 buys, I thought we'd be up. It was downer. But when you kind of step back and look at from an investor's point of view, which I often got to do because you would hear Dallas, you go, well, now, wait a minute. What master are we serving? This two-hour master that's paying us is putting a lot of smiles on a lot of faces. Matter of fact, we're doubling our office space. Matter of fact, we are giving this guy a raise. Matter of fact, we just got an international deal. So it wasn't all bad news within the ranks. It was a bad Sunday. 
that I'll say bad Sunday. It didn't quite lead up to expectations, but when those numbers come in, we're 60 days or 30 days down the line and we're on to the next thing and pay-per-views and international and Hey, we're going to get, get to run these live events. Or, uh, I called up with my buddy, Mike Cruson, uh, not long ago. And we were chatting. I said, Hey, what's that international deal for those live events? He said, Oh, that's 300 grand for our live. I mean, there were pockets of highly profitable events that we ran through the years. This particular Sunday, as you said, Steiner, Sting, Kurt, Karen, the whole story, the whole card, it was our Super Bowl. It just didn't come up to what we had all hoped for. We did not set realistic expectations, did we, Connie? No. <laughs> well, let's talk about the matches here. Uh, it's quite the undercard. Uh, there is one dark match. It's Chris Saban and Alex Shelley beating Joey Matthews and Johnny Swinger. Essentially a tryout match for those guys. Uh, and now it's time for our, our, our big show, man. Here we go. I highly recommend it. We told you at the very start of the show, we want you to go watch this It's impact wrestling.com forward slash packages. Use the promo code Jeff to sign up and watch this. And what you're going to be treated with in match one is the ultimate X match. Jeff, some of our listeners have no idea what this is. I want to explain who's in the match. And then you describe what this looks like. It's homicide and Hernandez taking on Elix Skipper and Sinchi. They're going to go 11 minutes and 55 seconds. The winning team is in line for a tag title shot. There's lots of, uh, focus here on Hernandez. Sinchi and Elix Skipper are just unbelievable performers. Everybody knows how much you and I love homicide. The observer gave this three and three quarter stars. The torch gave it three stars, but if you've never seen an ultimate X match, it's a sight to behold. So tell them what it looks like. It is a ladder match without a ladder, but no, it is two one inch cables, uh, formed in an X above the ring. And the, uh, object is you hang the belt right where the two cables intersect where they cross. So you hang the belt and just like a ladder match, you have to climb up and get the belt. The winner who gets the belt is the champion, but you don't have a ladder to climb. You have to go over on the tone buckles, jump up, catch onto the cables, shimmy out over the ring, disconnect the belt and you're the champion. So that was the ultimate X match and man, oh man, nobody. And I, look, there's a lot of guys in this, but there were some AJ styles was so creative in these matches. It's uh, unbelievable. Right. We, we could go down a rabbit hole, but I love this match. I think it's very, very unique and very, very compelling. Go out of your way to see it. It's a really fun match. It's a great concept. It's different. If you're looking for different, this checks that box. Next up, Eric Young is going to win a reverse battle Royal in 11 minutes and 46 seconds. The rules were they started with 16 men on the floor. The first eight who went over the top rope to get in the ring would go into a battle Royal that would go until there were two men left. They'd have a singles match under regular rules. The idea here is that the winner gets a title shot, but on the day of the show, they added another layer of steps that the final eight would then be seated into a tournament on impact that would determine the title shot. Who could keep all of that straight rather than their own talent, both with being the final entrant with their bells and whistles that he was in being the focal point, they played they portrayed junior Fatu as the biggest star. When you don't have the guts to build a future, ultimately you're left without much of a future says Dave Meltzer. The guys who didn't make it in the ring were BG and Kip James, Sanjay Dutt, shark boy. Who's wearing a neck brace, Chris Harris, Petey Williams, and Jimmy Rafe. The eight guys who made it in were young versus James storm Fatu versus Robert rude, Chris Saban versus Alex Shelley. And Frankie Kazarian versus Lance Hoyt. Um, yeah. Talk to me about this. What do you remember about this reverse battle Royal? And I, when it turns into, I, I, mean, a I don't remember the steps being added. So we didn't have a one person winner in this. So what it is, is there's seven men in one spot left. Chris Harris and James storm rush in storm gets in first young throws out storm immediately. Everyone gangs up and throws out Fatu. Saban and Shelly work as a tag team doing fast double team moves that end with a highlight of the match. Kazarian eliminates Shelly rude and Kazarian were both on the apron after going over the top. 
Rude gave Kazarian a rock bottom. Cass fell off the apron. He's eliminated. Rude then pushed Hoyt off the top rope to the floor, so he's out, leaving Rude. Saban and Rude are now the final three. Saban gets knocked off the top rope, leaving Rude versus Young, the former tag team partners. Rude goes for his fisherman suplex, but Young turns it into an inside cradle for the pin. Eric Young wins the reverse battle royal, but oh yeah, we've still got a tournament on impact as a result of this. Okay. Yeah. I don't remember adding that tournament. I guess that again, Vince wanting to write TV. Vince did not feel responsible at all for pay-per-view buys. He felt responsible for writing stories on the TV, which again, it's, it's, it's the balance that, that we often had challenges at, but I guess that was an extra. And I said, do I, that, that when I read that back, I'm like, what the hell? We're going to see the guys just for TV. Can't we just do that on Thursday? But anyhow, another discussion. Here's some more heat from the observer here. The show also featured some bait and switch and a repeat of perhaps the most tasteless angle of the year. It's been advertised as Pac-Man Jones and Ron Killings defending the tag straps against AJ Styles and Tom Co. However, they announced that Jones wasn't going to wrestle because of issues with the Titans. Being that Jones has wrestled, if that's the term for being in the corner and never making contact on several occasions now, why would he now suddenly be pulled? Now, as with all the Jones matches, if signing him actually would have sold one ticket, or increased TV ratings one iota, it would be a pretty bad bait and switch. They took out ads on Raw with Jones Wrestling being the focal point, and in the TV ads for the show, it was Jones, not Sting or Angle, who were pushed as the big stars. The only reason nobody cared is because even with all the advertising, nobody bought the show to see him. Killings ended up teaming with newcomer Consequences Creed. Love him. Who dressed up like Apollo Creed from the early Rocky movies. I guess they were a team here defending the tag titles. The original booking idea was for Jones to turn on killings and set something up for November, but Jones may be finished with the company since his original deal expired with this show. Creed is a wrestler from NWA anarchy who uses the name Austin Creed and does the same gimmick while green in spots. He was acrobatic and looked good. Originally two cold Scorpio was going to be used in that role but a deal wasn't put together in time. Jones was at ringside. Even though Jones is from Atlanta, he was booed out of the place. Then Tyson and Tom Coe became the de facto biggest baby faces on the show, except for sting for the finish. Jones threw money in the ring to distract styles killings, then rolled up styles. However, referee Earl Hebner wasn't counting because he was too big, busy picking up the bills and pocketing them. Tomko and Styles did the double team spinning slam move that Tomko and Giant Bernard used in New Japan that La Resistance uses in WWE on Killings, and that's the pin. A really good match until the tasteless finish. Three and three quarter stars in the Observer. Of course, this Apollo Creed character we're talking about, Consequences Creed. That's Xavier Woods, boys and girls from New Day, and here he is all those years ago in TNA, fifteen years ago. Man, where does the time go? Conrad, when he came through the curtain and I, 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 I just remember going, damn, why didn't we have him to begin with? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he's an Atlanta boy. No, he's from there. And we knew we needed a replacement. The, the Titans and the whole Pac-Man thing, it became completely unraveled in that everybody dug in deeper and deeper and deeper. And we're going to breach you and this and that and his court case. It was the ambition uh, the mission was completely aborted, obviously, by we just had to get through the night. I just wanted to put a footnote and a button on that whole damn thing. <laughs> uh, Meltzer would say Jones was apparently uncooperative about doing media locally for the show, which got people upset since he was earning so much per shot. Jones argued he wasn't getting paid for media, but Jeff Jarrett's argument is that his contract calls for him to do media to promote his appearances. Jones, unlike Sting, did go to the fan fest. And when Jarrett talked with him about media, Jones just told him he's ready to go back to his old job that pays 10 times more than this one. Whew. So that ends the Pac-Man experience. Is this report from Meltzer correct? He was not really willing to do the media, but he did go to fan fest and told you he's tired yeah. of this shit, ready for football. And you got to remember that, uh, the, the, the timing of all this, Conrad, is that 
me and Pac-Man knew each other outside the business and we're buddies. And then all of a sudden he's like, I don't want to do this media. I'm like, Pac, you know, the Titans dug in your attorneys digging in. We need you to go promote, D do something to earn your paycheck, anything. No, man. I mean, it, it, I don't say it got ugly cause it wasn't we're buds to this day, but it was like all sides were ready to end this thing, but he was difficult to get to do media and yeah, there, there was a, there was a salty conversation, but it was over. Next up, we got Jay lethal retaining the X division title, beating Christopher Daniels in 10 minutes and 55 seconds. Meltzer would say it's going to be a real strong match and a super hot crowd. You even hear him chanting. This is awesome. At one point. Uh, three and a half stars in the observer. I don't think Jay lethal and Christopher Daniels could have a bad match. If they tried, they tore the house down. And when you, we talk about the TNA faithful as fans. So let's call it 4,000 of them in the Atlanta Metro area. They knew Jay. They knew Chris. They knew the X division. They were, I mean, those guys tore the house down. Shout out to Kazarian won the X division championship at bound for glory Friday. So, uh, pretty cool that you were talking about these names 15 years ago and Kaz just won it Friday, but Jay and Chris, Chris had, I mean, both of them did, but Chris had great chemistry with, with everyone in the X division. He, him and Jerry Lynn and AJ, they, they just knew how to connect the dots with that style of wrestling. Next up it's a two out of three falls, uh, or two out of three tables match with the Steiner brothers and team 3d. Now Meltzer would say it's not a good match, but the crowd is so hot for the Steiners that it came across. Well, yep. they're going to start brawling, but here's, what's really cool. There's a 3d on Rick Steiner through the table. So there's your first table. As for that second table, what if Scott Steiner's old ass used a Frankensteiner off the top rope on bully Ray through a fucking table. It happened. Yep. 15 years ago. Scott Steiner is Frankensteinering Bubba Ray Dudley off the top rope through a table in TNA in the building came unglued. Go back and watch it, folks. Go it's back and watch it. <laughs> Go back and watch it. Um, there is a bad spot. Where, uh, Bully Ray is going to give Scott a low blow and start whipping him with a studded belt. He puts Scott on the table and the table breaks. So technically the, St the Steiners have just lost. Yep. And everyone ignores it. And Mike today explains, no, no, you have to be put through the table. Chris Saban and Alex Shelley come out. They're going to be working a program with 3d. So Devon goes to hit Scott with a chair. Scott ducks. Bully Ray gets hit, knocked out of the ring. Scott then puts Devon on his shoulders and Rick comes off the top with a bulldog through a table for the win. Meltzer doesn't love it, gives it a star and three quarters, but boy, from a fan and a crowd response, a Frankensteiner through a table is about as big as it's going to get. Right. And Scott is a big man. Yeah. Those tables were not gimmicked. No. <laughs> so 260, 270, 280, we'll crack a table with no force. Gail Kim is going to win a gauntlet style rumble match to crown the first ever TNA knockouts champion. Meltzer would say it's not the best of ideas introducing so many women in one match, but he did say that ODB showed a lot of charisma in particular, amazing Kong who they called awesome Kong was highlighted as the powerhouse. Um, Meltzer would say this. She also had her top fly up when she was thrown over the top rope. With no sports bra underneath, it was the first boob shot on pay-per-view in a long time. Can't believe that's in here, but there it is. Get him, Dave. Hey, the table is set for the knockouts division right here. It really is. Yes. Uh, by design. Meltzer gave it two stars. He says they've got potential to have a far more interesting women's division than WWE. And you guys certainly lay, leaned into that. Gail Kim is obviously going to be the flag bearer for you guys. Really a fun show so far as we head towards Samoa Joe beating Christian Cage. And that's going to end Christian Cage's unbeaten streak here in TNA. Matt Morgan was the ref, and there's super heat all around. Joe's going to use a power slam for a near fall, and that brings Tomko out. He starts brawling with Matt Morgan at ringside. 
Uh, eventually, Cage uses a low blow and an unprettier for a near fall, but Joe comes back with an enzigiri, a muscle buster, and the choke, and Cage taps out in the middle. Dave loved it, called it a great match, gave it four stars, and it's a great way to help get Joe back on track. He's going to end a winning streak of his own. Really good match, really good story. Two of TNA's best here, wouldn't you agree? When you listen to the VO, I remember going through the production notes that Joe is ending another lengthy winning streak. Christian, like all of his matches, Christian, that's why he's still around today. He cares about it. He thinks about it, thinks about the stories he's going to tell. They worked really, really, they were, those two guys worked really, really well together. That's why when you hear the show rolled out, even a real negative as far as watching the show was Pac-Man, but you have Consequences Creed, a brand new, youthful, high energy. It, you can tell the show rolled through. The reverse battle roll on paper, when you talk about it, when Meltzer reports on it, you just want to go, oh, that's it. Watching it, you go, oh, okay, these guys got to get in the ring. Everybody leaves. Now they got to get thrown out. So it's everything clicked. The Joe Christian match, they had some great impact matches too. The the uh, I say impact on t- TV matches. This was a good pay per view match. Well, I'll tell you what, you got to be uh, you got to be sleeping good with how this show is going so far. I mean, it's, it's lots of topsy turviness and oh, this guy, that guy. But man, this is our biggest show of the year, and it's feeling pretty good. And, and we don't want you to sleep on it either. I want you to go check it out. I mean, I think it's uh, it's a fun uh, value impactwrestling.com forward slash packages. And speaking of not sleeping, that's something I don't know anything about because I got a chilly sleep daddy and you do too, Jeff. And let's just tell the truth. I don't think I sleep nearly as well without a chilly sleep. I I had to sleep one night recently without a chilly sleep. I tossed and turned. I got five or six hours. I need my usual seven, eight, nine with chilly sleep. It really does spoil you. Doesn't it, Jeff? At the beach that day three, Karen, in the middle of the night or early in the morning rolled over or something. She goes, you've tossed a lot. And like, cause my, my, it's hard for me to sleep. I can't sleep on my left shoulders. I sleep on my right side or on my back. And I go, no chilly sleep. She goes, that's it. That's why you're so hot. <laughs> that's well, I got a little sun down here, but anyway, I love me some uh, the chilly sleeps. Great. So when I rolled into bed last night, it was, Plug that baby bad boy back in and it was a nice slept like a baby. It's fantastic, man. Sleep me is the new home for chili sleep. We're bringing you the same great sleep that chili sleep offered, but under a new name sleep. Me offers the coldest and most comfortable sleep systems available. They create the environment that meets the body's natural need for lower core temperatures, promoting deeper, more restorative sleep. They've got the Uller. That's what Jeff and I have the cube and now the doc pro sleep system. Either way, we're talking water-based, temperature-controlled mattress toppers. These fit over your existing mattress. It's like a smart thermostat for your bed. These mattress pads keep your bed at the perfect temperature, your perfect temperature for deep, cold sleep. Chilly Sleep and Sleep Me are designed to help you fall asleep, stay asleep, and give you the confidence and energy to power through your day. Prior to Chilly Sleep, man, I was not sleeping that good. Uh, I didn't know that, but now with chilly sleep or the new sleep me, I have bright, vivid, colorful dreams. I'm not getting up and down. I'm not tossing and turns turning. I'm not flipping the pillow. I'm not fighting with the cover. I fall asleep. I stay asleep. And I know I'm more productive at work as a result of that. They launched a brand new doc pro sleep system. I want to brag about this for you guys. It's got two times more cold power than the other models. It's whisper quiet. And it's a tubeless mattress pad design that they say allows for five times more cool in contact. I don't have that yet, but I'm getting it. I'm sold on chilly sleep. I've got multiple. You will too. My wife and I sleep in the same bed and keep our bed at different temperatures. Think about that. My side is cooler than hers. She automates hers. She's got the app on her phone, the new sleep me app. Her bed starts getting cold on time, the same time every night. And she likes to warm up to wake up. It's automatically done. Head over to sleep.me forward slash my world to learn more. Save 20% off the purchase of any new Doc Pro, Cube, or Uller sleep system. This offer is available exclusively for my world with Jeff Jarrett listeners. It's only for a limited time. That's sleep, S L E E P dot M E slash my world to take advantage of our exclusive discounts and wake up refreshed every day. Sleep.me forward slash my world. Jeff, what were you saying? 
just the last thing. And, and I know podcasts and advertise it's, it's how kind of the world goes around here, but I'll just say this on sleep me. If I was sitting in the car, listening to the podcast and yeah. that came on, you just Conrad makes them so damn entertaining and they're fun and, and, and engaging and all that. But at the very core of this ad, folks, we spend a third of our life asleep. Yeah. You do not know what you're missing because you've never tried it. I just had a full testimony week. I have spent a lot of time home with, with one on my bed. I go on vacation and go three, four, five, six, seven days without it. You don't know what you're missing until you miss it. I'm telling you folks, it is, they're awesome. It's a great investment in your overall health. I love it. You will too. Check it out right now. Sleep.me forward slash my world. So next up, we got Abyss winning a four ways monsters ball match over Raven, Rhino, and Black Rain. Meltzer would say it's your basic weapons match. The heat was way down from the prior match and repeated weapon shots didn't get over, but they did enough to get the crowd back. Of course, eventually Raven's bloody Abyss is on a table. He's laying there forever. Raven and Black Rain are arguing over who's going to jump off the top rope. Eventually, Rhino hits Rain with a gore. There's some kendo stick shots. Raven's going to dump some thumbtacks on the mat. Jim Mitchell comes out with a bag of broken glass. Abyss is going to block it, give Raven a black hole slam into the thumbtacks and glass for the pin. Two and a half stars in the observer. I mean, listen, Abyss winning a monster's ball match is just the way it should be. I guess you needed some sort of let me up match before the main event. And that's what we're getting here with the monsters ball, you know, on the big shows, the granddaddy of them all for whatever potion you want to knock it out of the park, every match on these type shows and inevitably the crowd gets tired at some point. It could have happened in the next division match. It could have happened in the knockouts match. It could have happened anywhere mid to, to late in the show. They got them back. They, they were just flat, but they were, the audience was tired at this point until about mid match. And the people came back up when you go out, when you, when you watch this, you'll see, oh, that's what Jeff was talking about. They, they delivered big time, big time. Now it's time for our main event. While we're all here, what a match it is. Sting and Kurt Angle are going to go 18 minutes and 26 seconds. And Sting is your new TNA champion. Angle uses three German suplexes for a near fall. Sting's going to come back with the Scorpion Deathlock. Eventually, Karen Angle comes out, violates her restraining order. The ref boots her from the ring. And with no ref, Kevin Nash, who spent the entire show acting like he was fed up and wasn't going to help Kurt and was buddies with Sting, turned on Sting. Unpredictability at times is good. When you always don't make sense, it teaches people to not care. Nash gave Sting a clothesline and Angle covered, but no ref. Sting made a comeback and went for a splash off the top, but Angle got his knees up. Angle went to the top and did a 450 double knee drop. It didn't look pretty at all. And Angle put on the ankle lock, but Sting kicked Angle off and he crashed into Nash. Sting used the Scorpion death drop on Angle, but there's no ref to count. Finally, Andrew Thomas came in to count and Nash pulled him out of the ring and decked him. It turned into every Raw main event of 2000. Sting was bumping Nash and Angle around, and Angle got the baseball bat. Angle went to hit Sting, and Sting was supposed to block it. He missed blocking it as the bat went right through Sting's open hands and caught him in the head. It actually made the match much better because Sting bled hard way from taking the shot, and the crowd got off on him no selling a baseball shot to the head when he made his comeback. Sting then got the bat and hit Angle with it three times, nailed Nash, and then got the pin with the Scorpion Death Drop. Three and three quarter stars. So listen, maybe a little overbooked mess. People love Kevin Nash though. Uh, Karen angle is a hell of a TV performer. People love the bat, but when you see the bat slip through his open hands and hit the dude in the head for real, yikes! if you're watching this on a monitor, you gotta be thinking, holy shit, what's going to happen now? Because at this point, if he's unconscious or if he's cut or if he's hurt bad, there's no backup plan here. How relieved are you when it felt like he was still with it and moving you, forward? Just knowing, I mean, go back and watch it. Uh, the finishing sequence to all of this was so damn good. Yeah. 
it was really, 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 really suspenseful. And, and, you know, who helped, who helps age in a match like that? I, I give my props to, I mean, I was probably the lead agent on it. I know you're going to say that, but I, but no, but let me back up. You cut mail. I give Kurt his props when yeah. Kurt can sit down and think things through and look sting. And I'm sure Nash they're vets and they're pros and they're going to have this, but if Kurt can sit down and really think things through and know where we're ultimately going to get, he's got an uncanny ability of layering things up that fit him. Obviously they should, he's in the match, but, uh, just high drama, really, really good. So I'll, I'll, you were saying who's aging. I was probably just agent by paper, uh, and, and making sure other matches don't do what they're going to do. But, um, the baseball bat shot was God almighty. It's, uh, this ain't no ballet son. Uh, but, but, uh, hats off to all of them as performers. Very, very well done. Do you think it was too many swerves? You know, that's damned if you do, damned if you don't. Here here would be in the locker room two hours, three hours, four hours beforehand, Conrad, the story behind the story. You know what? It's going to be a long night. We're on last. We better make sure, because you never know, sometimes a, a false finish or a swerve is that one thing that the people – stand up and then they never sit back down on because you've convinced them so much that this is the finish. And then if you do two or three false finishes after that, it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger, but going on last. Yes. You can do sometimes overbook it, overdo too much, but I had always had a lot of faith in Kurt as far as a finish man, big time. what did you think of the show, Jeff overall thumbs up, thumbs down, thumbs up, thumbs up. but a big, big to me, a big, again, they're, set the wrong expectations. It, 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 I just thought staying positioned to win the title, but they're just, the heat was on hindsight. 2020 was really on Kirk Karen. It wasn't, yeah, it was the restraining order. It, it didn't align good TV story. Didn't convert by us. I, uh, I'm fired up. I can't believe that this is, uh, something that we've gotten a hold of, but we have the actual show format, the production sheet for this actual show posted over at adfreeshows.com. Mm -hmm. So if you want to see what a run sheet for a pay-per-view looks like, here it is. Uh, for example, Pat Kenny was the agent for the X division tag match and the X division title match and the monsters ball match. Scott Demore had the fight for the right, the women's gauntlet and the Steiner's team 3d match. Jim Cornette produced the tag title match, Joe versus Christian in the main event. Vince Russo produced all the pre-tapes. There's lots of really fun stuff that if you want to see how a show is formatted, we've got it posted over at adfreeshows.com. Also over there, you'll find our brand new episode of WCW, uh, the world title. We call it title chase. And I'm pretty excited about this series. We, uh, we, we sort of reimagined what it would look like. We take a look at that 1992 WCW world title that you remember sting and Ron Simmons and Vader and Lex Luger and Ric Flair holding. We break all that down on the one year anniversary of Reggie parks passing with his protege and, and famed belt maker himself, Mr. Dave Milliken. So we, cel we celebrate that title. Uh, here on the, the anniversary of Reggie's passing and really the 30 year anniversary of Ron Simmons winning that world title. Wow. We also have a fantastic conversation with uh, Bill after from uh, an episode we call ad free shows insiders. He shares some stories he's never shared before about Hulk Hogan and Vince McMahon from way back when in the 1980s tomorrow night, after our big debate last week, me and Eric about Raven. Raven has come out of the woodwork to face Eric Bischoff and confront him about the shit show experience he had in WCW. And it happens live tomorrow night on adfreeshows.com. You can be in the room when they're going back and forth to talk about that WCW experiment. Uh, Tony Schiavone has a live Q and a this week. Jake Roberts is going to sit down and watch Halloween havoc. 1992, the coal miners glove match with sting where the snake bit his face. It's crazy. And even here, you're going to be watching some old Tripla 
with Pauly Bromwell over at adfreeshows.com. Is that right? Gonna have a guest. My bride. Wow. How about that? Because me and her in Mexico, as we're going to, the time Ray Mysterio, 619. Listen to this. The time Ray Mysterio, 619, time, me and my wife. Does that sound right? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. That should have been a transition to a blue chew ad. But anyhow, that, uh, the night that, uh, they put the witch hat on her and the dress and, but we're talking triple mania, obviously watch triple mania.com coming up next Saturday, but yeah, we're going to have a fun this discussion. Saturday, Jeff. It's this Saturday. Shit. Can you believe it? Time flies. Now I know I'm going to be in Mexico city and yeah. I said that Eric Bischoff is going to be hosting a little viewing party in Wyoming. He's going to have a, a Mexican dinner catered there at the ranch. Are, are you and Cody going to plop down? And watch Triple Mania and his favorite wrestler ever, Psycho Clown, and relive the good old days. Triple Mania is the post volunteer celebration. Oh, Alabama will get beat earlier that day. So roll tide out from the top of the rankings. Volunteers win. And then we're going to watch a little tripla. Watch triplemania.com. Watch triplemania.com. I'm pumped about it. It's going to be a lot of fun. Next week, we'll be back talking about the formation of the main event mafia here on my world. And I'm sure we'll be talking about triple mania, but you and I are both going to be watching it. And I want to remind everybody at the end of this program, we've got a really cool little preview video of triple mania. I think you're going to want to stick around to see. Oh yeah, definitely. Awesome. Enjoyed it today, pal. Hey, it was a good time. Hope you guys did. I hope you'll check out all these shows early and ad free over at adfreeshows.com including that unbelievable face-to-face with Eric and Raven and the WCW title chase and Bill Actor and Jake Roberts and Tony Schiavone and Karen, Karen, come on. Watch triplemania.com and adfreeshows.com. We'll see you next week right here. Talking main event mafia on my world. Peace. There is a love for the cultura of Lucha. Lucha, it's part of the heritage of Mexico, it is recognized as part of its culture, and they have their own wrestling syndicate. And when you are a luchador in Mexico, uh, you are well respected. For Mexican people, there is football, which is soccer, and there's lucha. That's it. I believe that the, the touch of the culture of Mexico was very, very instrumental in a lot of the developments of Canadian stars and American stars. In a way, they were were touched by this incredible heroes, the masked luchadores and luchadoras. If you really talk to them, they will tell you that there was, there was a huge influence on how that, that approach came into help uh, their careers, a lot of them. But the mask is like everything. The mask is, is the passion. A luchador and a luchadora will protect their mask with their lives. Guys like El Santo or guys like Blue Demon or Mil Mascaras, uh, they will not take their mask off for you until they're certain that you will protect that secret of the identity. So the mask is a culture thing, but it's also the, that part that sets them into another qualification. So, and you have like 200 million uh, fans uh, that are there for us to reach. And I think that AAA has been doing a fantastic job. And Luchador loves Lucha. Luchador respects Lucha Libre. And the Luchador or Luchadora will do their best to keep that passion going. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson. Thanks for checking out the podcast here on YouTube. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you can notice anytime we upload some new content. And go save yourself some money right now. If you're in a 30-year loan or you have credit card debt, it's not a matter of if I can save you money. It's a matter of how much. Find out right now for free at SaveWithConrad.com.